Thank you. The next item of business is the debate on motion 1468 in the name of Richard Lockhead on safeguarding Scotland's international research collaborations and reputation for scientific excellence from the threat of Brexit. That's a mouthful. Um, I call on Richard Lockhead to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 13 minutes or thereabouts. We have a little time in hand for interventions and so on. Minister. Uh, could we have the minister's microphone, please? Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, yesterday I visited Queen Margaret University where I was given a tour by the wonderful principal Petra Vend. Petra has been at the helm for nine years and recently announced that she'll be standing down next summer. So I want to use this opportunity to pay tribute to the enormous contribution she has made and continues to make to higher education in Scotland. Petra is German. And during my tour, I was struck by the international character of the university. I visited a laboratory where I met two academics who were there to show me around. The senior research fellow was from the Netherlands. The PhD student was Greek. Later on, I had a presentation with the head of student services. He is Bulgarian. 15% of the students at Queen Margaret are EU nationals and around 9% of the staff are EU nationals. Across Scotland's universities and colleges and research institutions, students and staff from the EU are making an enormous contribution to Scotland and our global reputation for excellence. Many institutions benefit greatly from EU membership with 19% of the Aberdeen University students alone being EU nationals. But as a result of Brexit, during my various visits, I am hearing similar messages everywhere I go. I'm hearing universities hiring immigration lawyers, about staff in tears, about staff and students feeling less welcome, uncertain, insecure. I'm hearing about talented and valued staff contemplating leaving Scotland and the UK. And following the UK's decision to leave the EU, I'm hearing everywhere about the short and long-term threat Brexit poses to Scotland's research base, to funding, to our international standing, and our influence, and our reputation for science, research and innovation, and educational excellence that one principle quite rightly described to me as beyond world class. And presiding officer, or deputy presiding officer, I think all of this damage is self-inflicted. No wonder the principal of Glasgow University, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, said that a hard Brexit would represent the most unhinged example of national self-sabotage in living memory. Now, Scotland's story, and especially that of our universities, has been shaped by a close relationship with Europe. Today, our research institutions increasingly work together to increase impact, but we've always recognised that cooperation within Scotland or the UK alone has never been enough for real success. World-leading success comes from reaching out beyond our borders across the globe and across Europe, of course, to add value to research endeavours in Scotland. And Scotland's building on a great history here, going back centuries with early links to Europe. Our first universities were set up in the 15th century, with St Andrews, Glasgow and Aberdeen all founded through papal bulls, giving them the seal of approval to award degrees. And because of the wars of independence with England, Scottish students had, until then, studied in continental Europe. Europe influenced Scotland, and Scotland influenced Europe and the world. The Scottish Enlightenment figures of David Hume, Adam Smith, and James Hutton changed our way of thinking about the world and our economy. And the first industrial revolution is unthinkable without James Watt's steam engine, bringing science and invention together with industry and engineering. Scientists and researchers in Scotland continue to shape society now leading also in aspects of the fourth industrial revolution, focused on linking our cyber and our physical worlds, for instance. But that's not the only area of impact. Our excellent research base in Scotland, which is comprised of universities, research institutes, and public research bodies, as well as third and private sector activity, is having a very positive impact in many aspects of Scottish society. This ranges from improved health and social care, indeed the news today, better access to digital communications, cleaner energy and transport, to improve safety and security, just to give a few examples. We all know that science and research is an extremely important activity in Scotland. The total investment in research and development in Scotland is £2.3 billion a year. And now more and more expert voices have been speaking out of the damage that Brexit is causing to this investment. Because international collaboration is the heart of success of science and research in this country. 
Scots born. No. Yes. David Stewart. The member will be aware of the tremendous record of Scottish scientists in Scotland that the Bank of England is going to honour in the new £50 note. Would the Minister share my campaign to have Professor John MacLeod, who discovered insulin from Aberdeen, on appearing on the new £50 note? Minister. Well, of course, I think Professor MacLeod has been an excellent candidate and has indeed many candidates in Scotland giving an enormous uh, successful track record uh, in science and innovation down the centuries that have made a difference to ordinary people's lives, not just in this country, but across the world. But you know, Scots-born Nobel laureate Sir Fraser Stoddart, and one other eminent scientist, has said, what's most important is to be able to have at least 15 different nationalities in a large research group. That's the way we do science. We do it at a global level. And Scotland is truly a global leader in science. We're an outward-looking country with valuable international collaborations that support high-quality research. The Scottish Government alone provides £500 million annually for science and research at Scotland's universities and our research institutes and public bodies, including NHS Scotland. And Scotland's higher education research and development spend, as a percentage of GDP, was ranked top of all parts of the UK and fifth highest in the OECD countries in 2016. A phenomenal track record. And this has been leading to results on research excellence. Three Scottish universities are in the Times Higher Education Global Top 200 for research volume, income and reputation. And four in the Global Top 200 for research influence as measured by publication citations. And all of this, all of this underpins Scotland's economy and Scottish jobs. The latest figures show that private investment in research in Scotland surpassed the £1 billion mark for the first time ever. In 2016, 23% of new UK spin-outs, 23% are from Scottish universities, more than again in any other part of the UK. And just last month, Nova Innovation was awarded the Enterprise Europe Network Award 2018 for its work on renewable energy as part of a pan-European project. Ironic then, ironic then, that our full participation in the European programme that supported this project, Horizon 2020, is now being threatened because of Brexit. And Scotland has so far secured almost 558 million euros from Horizon 2020 alone. Our universities are well connected globally. Scottish universities have a high percentage of EU students, a higher percentage in other parts of the UK, and more than a quarter, a quarter of all full-time university research staff are from the EU countries. So we punch way above our weight. And it's no wonder then that the Times Higher Education World University Rankings for 2019 show that nine of Scotland's universities are in the global top 200 for international outlook. But, presiding officer, I want to not just highlight our truly outstanding international research community in Scotland and our global, global connections. I want us to safeguard all of that for the future as well. Professor Lee Cronin from the University of Glasgow recently gave the clearest of warnings about the impact of Brexit on science and research in this country. He said, if I can't run a world-leading team of researchers here, I am not going to let the skills, knowledge and momentum we've built die because of a hard Brexit. Many of us will be forced to move our research abroad. So I'm shocked, and I'm sure many are, and dismayed at the casual attitude the UK government has been taking towards the threat that Brexit poses to Scotland's global reputation for world-leading research that it poses to the freedom of movement of both Scottish and EU researchers, and that it poses to the Scotland's ability to compete and participate in the key European research programmes as well. Years of building trust through cooperation and partnership now being sacrificed thanks to infighting in the Conservative Party in Westminster. And this impact is starting to be felt. According to data in the science journal Nature, UK participation as a lead coordinator in EU multilateral projects through Horizon 2020, has significantly reduced since 2016. And there's many other impacts as well. The third sector invests significant amounts of money in Scottish research, and now one of the key research funding charities, the Wellcome Trust, has raised concerns around the impact of Brexit on its future potential investments. Its director, Jeremy Farrar, has stated, we have invested in the UK for more than 80 years. It has provided an environment in which science and innovation can thrive. But if the conditions and the culture here are damaged, that will affect our support because it's not unconditional. If such damage to our reputation and status can be done even before Brexit, it's easy to see why so many are anxious about the situation after the 29th of March next year. And the Scottish Government's paper, Scotland's Place in Europe, Science and Research, published earlier this week, quotes the recent letter of 29 Nobel 
prize winners to the Prime Minister, which says, science needs to flourish and that requires a flow of people and ideas across borders. Yet the UK's yeah, hostile rhetoric and attitude isn't helping to make EU friends or EU friends in this country feel welcome here at home. And polling by trade union prospects show that nearly 70% of EU scientists in the UK are thinking of leaving after Brexit. So in a Scotland, a country that voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU, we should be resolutely focused on attracting the best minds in Europe to work and study here to help us build a successful and prosperous nation. But instead, thanks to the actions of others, we face the prospect of a Brexit brain drain. That's what we face. And we have to stand together, and we have to stop that happening. Now, I have been actively encouraging EU nationals that I've been meeting, as others have been as well, to continue to study and work at universities and other research organisations in Scotland. And it's really, really important that amidst the chaos of Brexit, we send out a message that Scotland is open for business and we welcome with open arms people from across EU countries to our universities and research institutions. Yeah. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank uh, the Minister for, for giving way, but does he think that the speech he's making here today says we are open for business or does it say we're focused entirely on, on the negative? Minister. I'm saying Scotland's open for business. I only wish the Conservative Party would say that as well. And can I say, can I say I support the work being done by universities and colleges to reassure and support EU staff and their families as far as it's possible. In addition to the effect of people already here, the Home Office's current approach to visiting scientists and researchers has also already been damaging. Damaging to our reputation and our ability to welcome experts from around the world. Numerous esteemed scientists who were due recently to attend and speak at the World Congress of Psychiatric Genetics held in Glasgow were denied entry to Scotland due to visa delays and refusals. This is really unacceptable and threatens to get worse if researchers from Europe are going to be treated by the UK government with the same relentless hostility. It's become increasingly clear that the UK government will offer at best a hugely damaging blindfold Brexit which would still leave us guessing about the long-term future of our valuable research collaborations which the UK government's made very little progress to secure. Deputy President Officer, international collaboration is critical to maintaining and strengthening Scotland's excellence in research, as well as meeting our economic policy goals and improving public services in this country. We should not allow Brexit and the hostile immigration policies of the UK government to constrain Scotland's scientific and economic progress. We should ensure that Scotland will continue to be an outward-looking, open and welcoming country. Compared to the rest of the UK, Scotland, employs proportionally more EU academic staff in our universities and institutions. We have proportionally more EU students. We have proportionally more outgoing domestic students participating in Erasmus+. Plus. We punch way above our weight in securing EU research funding. And we have a higher rate of research staff from the EU working in Scottish institutions. So Scotland voted to remain in the EU, but is facing Brexit with our further and higher education and research sectors having the most to lose. Our voice therefore deserves to be heard and heeded. Maintaining single market membership and freedom of movement, including for students, staff and researchers, is therefore more important to Scotland than to the UK as a whole. And maintaining participation in EU research programmes is more important to Scotland than to the UK as a whole. So in conclusion, I say we must do all we can to protect this vital national sector from the reckless actions of the UK Tory government and Brexit, and I commend the motion to Parliament. Thank you, and I call Oliver Mundell to speak to and move Amendment 1468.1. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to begin by focusing on the positive. It's easy in the current political climate to jump straight to the negative, to challenge and dispute what other people have said, but sometimes it's also important to stop and take stock of the positive and realise that despite the differences of opinion that exist, there is a great deal we can agree on. This chamber needs no reminding of the exceptional work our universities, research institutes and departments do. However, it remains vitally important that we do everything we can to tell this incredible story, both domestically and around the world. Indeed, arguably, the task of articulating and celebrating the outstanding contribution that these skilled and dedicated scientists, academics and researchers make to our nation, not only economically, but also culturally, 
is even more important post-Brexit. I remain absolutely sure, as a Leave voter myself, that practically no one voted to diminish the role of our universities, to diminish our international standards for excellence in research, to reduce or decrease the strong international links we enjoy both with Europe and the rest of the world when it comes to being at the forefront of scientific advances. No thank you right now. Indeed, I believe whether, whatever our respective stances are in relation to Brexit, the vast majority of Scots want to see our university sector, our research sector, our scientific sector survive, grow and thrive, not just in a European sense, but in a truly global world where creating new connections and working together to solve the major challenges we face, whether that be good healthcare or climate change, is vitally important, not just to Scotland, but to the whole of humanity. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Mundell for giving me. I wonder if you could answer this question for me. Does he believe that those uh, laudable objectives, which I endorse, will be enhanced or diminished by the UK government's opposition to freedom of movement for EU citizens? Oliver Mundell. I think that there are challenges that lie ahead. I don't stand here today, presiding officer, and deny that. The fundamental uh, climate in which our, our country operates internationally is going to change. But we have to remember, at the end of the day, that's what the British people, as a majority, voted for. And the job of the UK government is to try and balance out those different, uh, those different priorities. I would also stress to the Scottish Government, which has been completely absent uh, from today's debate so far, that the UK Government is working very hard to ensure the continued settled status uh, of EU nationals. And we want to send out a message, and certainly from these benches, uh, where we very strongly want to send out this message today that all EU nationals are welcome uh, here in Scotland and we very much value the contribution they make, not just uh, to the uh, education sector, but right across uh, our society. I've taken an intervention already and I'll just make a little bit of progress. It is in that positive spirit uh, that I brought forward today's Scottish Conservative Amendment uh, to the government's motion and I'm pleased to move it in my name. I also think it's important to highlight that the Scottish further education sector and indeed many of our research institutions do not exist in isolation. And that is both true in a UK sense, the European sense and beyond. And again, I think it's important to get that balance right. From my reading of the government's motion uh, for this debate, there seems to be a lack of balance and nuance. And where possible, we have sought to strip some of the politics out of the motion because whilst the concerns that many in the sector have outlined give cause to reflect and deserve careful consideration and debate, I believe it serves no one's purpose to seek to politicise the sector or to politicise those concerns or in any way to suggest that the sector overall is at risk. I remain confident for the reasons outlined in our amendment that the UK government is doing everything it can to achieve an orderly Brexit, a negotiated Brexit, a Brexit that will allow many of those relationships to continue and flourish, while at the same time enabling new partnerships and relationships to grow. I particularly welcome the Chancellor's commitment to, uh, of existing funding up until 2020, and for that matter, a number of new government, the number of new government initiatives that have been announced since the British public voted to leave the EU. And some of my colleagues will talk more uh, on that. I believe that these initiatives help shore up the university se sector uh, and will support new and innovative research across Scotland and across the United Kingdom. I am also pleased that the UK will continue participating in the Horizon programme and that the UK and the EU's intention is that UK researchers and businesses will remain eligible to participate in Horizon 2020 and that that will remain unchanged for the duration of the programme. This has already been agreed as part of the financial settlement which was signed off by both the UK and the EU Commission negotiators in a draft withdrawal agreement and welcomed by the other 27 countries at the March European Council. What's more, the next Horizon scheme uh, could absolutely include the UK and would be desirable for that to be the case with the new funding scheme due to last from 2021 to 2027. As the EU Commission have already indicated, the legal text supporting that programme is done in such a way which could include the UK in future as a third country and that the doors are open for discussion. 
I believe this flexibility is to be welcomed and that is why we're pleased to support Labour's amendment today. And we will do all that we can to help secure a positive future involvement for the UK in Horizon. Just like the Scottish Conservatives have urged the UK government to ensure that the visa system is structured to attract students and staff of the highest calibre to work in UK universities and research centres. We believe there is no impediment to this remaining the case in post-Brexit Britain and will continue to strongly make that case as outlined in our amendment today. Finally, before turning to my conclusion, I would simply like to say to the Liberal Democrats uh, that we won't be able to support uh, their uh, amendment to the motion at decision time. While I commend them on their at, at some time somewhat obsessive wish uh, to hold another referendum, we believe that this matter has already been settled and that the best Brexit deal will now be secured by ensuring cooperation across all the parties with everyone doing what they can to support the Prime Minister as she seeks to build a consensus. Which takes... Yeah? Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Mundell. He, um, he sets out an argument uh, in his, before he got onto the Liberal Democrat amendment about continuing to make the case for um, an appropriate approach to immigration, I think were the words that he used. But this parliament unanimously has agreed to a proposition that we should have a reintroduction of the, uh, the, the Fresh Talent Initiative, the Post-Study Work Visa Initiative. And we've agreed that unanimously across this chamber and the UK government has said no. What are we supposed to do when the UK government is oblivious to unanimity in this institution on this point, which we all think would be a sensible idea? How can we have confidence, having had that experience, in the argument that Mr Mandela is putting forward that somehow there will be a pragmatic approach taken to immigration when all of the evidence currently flies in the face of that. Oliver Mundell. Here we go. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for uh, his intervention and I think it comes back to where I started. Uh, clearly, Presiding Officer, I adopt a much more positive approach uh, and I think that what we've got to do is, is, is work towards uh, the system that we want to see. I think we've got to uh, take time to reflect on all the comments that have come in relation to the immigration system from the CBI, uh, from uh, NUS, uh, from the National Farmers Union Scotland. And we've got to uh, look, because these issues don't exist in isolation. The cabinet secretary looks confused, but immigration, uh, immigration to the university sector doesn't exist in isolation. And it's got to be part of a balanced package of measures that deliver not just for Scotland, but for the whole of the UK. And I think rather than uh, seeking uh, to, to make political hay out of uh, the, 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 the at times frustratingly slow progress, the Cabinet Secretary would be better uh, recognising that on these benches we are working very hard to achieve the same goal. Uh, and that does take me nicely to my concluding remarks, uh, Presiding Officer, where I would simply ask the SNP at this time of national importance to look at their own motivations, mm -hmm. to ask themselves whether debates like this have been brought before the Chamber mm -hmm. in order to highlight an important issue, or whether debates like this have in fact been bef brought before the Chamber to use an important issue to further their own self-interest. Yeah. With the challenges that lie ahead, and given the significance of our international research collaborations and our reputation for scientific excellence, then surely the national interest must come first. And if the national interest does come first, then this is time to work together, to put politics aside and to back the Prime Minister in securing the certainty that a deal with the EU would offer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. And I call on Ian Gray to speak to and move Amendment 14638.3. Mr Gray, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me start. Um, I, I think I'm correct in saying that this is uh, Mr Lockhead's uh, first uh, debate in his new role uh, as Minister for Further and Higher Education. So uh, let me welcome him to his uh, place uh, and say how absolutely delighted I am that he chose uh, to uh, open, uh, his, uh, uh, open his tenure in, in that position uh, with uh, uh, that uh, paying to my own local university, Queen Margaret University in uh, East Lothian, uh, pointing out, of course, that it has for some 10 years now be led, been led by uh, the principal Petra Vend, who is, uh, of course, from Germany, uh, but that their international connections uh, and collaborations spread right the way through the, the, the operations uh, of that university. 
uh, through uh, groundbreaking research that they are involved in, in areas such as food science and uh, healthcare technology, to mention uh, just a couple of them. So uh, I'm delighted at that uh, debut by Mr. Lockhead and his, his new role. Uh, and I do welcome the opportunity to debate these issues today because they are uh, so important for Scotland uh, and to take the chance to move the amendment uh, in my name uh, as well. Uh, when it comes to debate in science, um, Albert Einstein usually has a quote that you can reach for uh, and the uh, opposite quote, I think, for today uh, is when Einstein said, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. Uh, and I'm not sure about the former. Uh, and I tend to think if Einstein came back, uh, he would uh, probably still be unsure about the structure of the universe, uh, even uh, with all the work that's gone on since his own work. Um, but I fear that the whole sorry saga of Brexit would rather convince him uh, that he'd been right, that he'd been right uh, all along uh, about human stupidity. For this has been a chaotic and catastrophic process. Uh, you know, there can be no doubt that the higher education sector in Scotland is world leading. In terms of teaching quality, we see many institutions in the top rankings, and we excel even further through the research that we produce. The minister pointed out already that in world university rankings, three Scottish universities are in the global top 200 for research, volume, income, and reputation and four of our universities are there for the influence that their research has. We also have amongst the most productive research institutions, nine of which are amongst the best in the whole world for their international outlook concerning staff, students, uh, and research. And that was brought home to me uh, most directly, I think, a few years ago when I participated in a delegation from the cross-party group on science and technology when we visited the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN. And it was astonishing, I have to say there, when, how many of the young scientists we met working on that international collaboration, who were from uh, Scottish universities, particularly Glasgow, Strathclyde and, and Edinburgh, uh, or were Scots studying at other universities, but working uh, at CERN, uh, and really had a, a significant leading role uh, in that quite remarkable uh, piece of uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, I, I, and it also brought home to you uh, the, uh, that other kind of link because we were lucky enough to be able to visit uh, the site of the experiment which had demonstrated the existence of the Higgs boson uh, at perhaps the most complex and elaborate piece of scientific kit in the world, thus proving something which Professor Higgs, of course, uh, had postulated using no more than his fountain pen sitting in Edinburgh University some 50 years uh, before that. Science is a global and international uh, operation and unfortunately the current mess and uncertainty of Brexit can only weaken Scotland's strong position in this. And our research excellence of course is very much influenced by those European links in particular. One pound in every 10 of Scottish universities research income comes from the EU around 105 million pounds every year. And that relates only to universities. It doesn't include the European research funding that goes elsewhere. Horizon 2020 has already been mentioned, the biggest EU research and innovation program, program there's ever been. And we see Scotland in the lead again, 13% of UK funding for that program coming to Scottish institutions. And it is so important that we continue to benefit from future Horizon programs hence the amendment we have before Parliament today. And of course it goes without saying that research is only as good as those who conduct it and the contribution that EU citizens make to our research sector is indeed vast. Over 12% of staff at our universities, 16% of our postgraduate population and indeed 60% of the UK's internationally co-authored research papers are with uh, EU partners. Uh, and I want to just briefly say that our scientific excellence doesn't just relate to life sciences and to STEM. Scotland and the wider UK is also a leader in social and hum humanities research. Significant amounts of research funding within these disciplines also linked to EU collaboration. Indeed, 
33% of all European Research Funding Council funding for social science research comes to the UK. So for such strong bonds to continue, it is vital that our academic researchers can still travel to European countries with ease uh, and vice versa. And, um, you know, it's, it's two years now since that referendum took place. And the trouble is, and I, I hear what Mr. Mundell said, but the trouble is that our higher education and scientific and research communities still have no idea what the consequences will be uh, of that result. They still don't know what the plans are that they will have to work with in order to mitigate the impact. And the truth is that, the tr I think I'm too late, the truth is that Brexit is already uh, uh, damaging science and research. A recent Nature magazine editorial says, regardless of, wh of whether or not a deal is done, many scientists are already seeing and feeling the impact of Brexit. Researchers are less likely to get collaborators uh, on projects because academics in Europe view them as a risky bet. Some are finding it harder to fill key positions. Others feel unable to apply for EU funding. The truth is, the impact is already here. To protect science, research, and the other sectors we are debating this afternoon, at the very least, we must work towards a deal which ensures we retain as close a relationship as is possible with the European Union. Call Tavish Scott to speak to and move Amendment 14638.2 for around six minutes, please. I'm sure Mr Gray would recognise that when the Deputy Presiding Officer dropped a bottle of water, she was merely testing one of Einstein's theories rather than uh, trying to uh, uh, interrupt his uh, uh, remarks. And I hear Oliver Mundell accusing uh, some of us of being obsessive. I must say, I, when I watched Jacob Rees-Mogg on the television and one or two others, I think there's a whole new definition of obsession. Uh, that I'd uh, only uh, care to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Mundell to uh, consider carefully. Um, can I too welcome Richard Lockhead to his place? I thought he might have got uh, fisheries research in. He spent eight years talking about that in, uh, in this place. And I suppose the point he would have made, and maybe I could help him make it, would be that there would be many um, people I can remember who worked at the Marine Lab in Torrey doing fisheries research uh, who were from every part of Europe and, and various other parts in between. And that still goes to this day and is still certainly the case with uh, the Marine Centre up in Scalloway in, in Shetland uh, too. Uh, when uh, any country faces the uncertainties of the modern world, it makes some sense to play to one's strengths. Uh, Scotland's higher education institutions, the research they do and the people they employ are a strength, a strength that has attracted academics from across the globe to the UK and to Scotland, a strength that has been a welcome mat for international students, a strength that demonstrates we are connected to part of the European universities and research infrastructure. We are simply part of a, that European family. Yet it is, a, it is a strength that we are in danger of now losing. That is why 35 Nobel laureates recently wrote to the Prime Minister calling for a deal on science and innovation and that allowed the closest possible cooperation between the UK and the EU. This is a group of outstanding people. They include the President of the Royal Society, Venki Ramakishkrin, and, and Dr. Richard Henderson, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2017 and who was born and studied at Edinburgh University. This strength is why 23 senior figures from the universities of Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, sorry, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and St Andrews signed an open letter warning, warning of the consequences of Brexit and calling for a people's vote. This strength explains why the biggest biomedical research lab in Europe, the Crick Institute in London, surveyed over 1,000 staff in October and found that 97% think a hard Brexit would be bad for UK science. Just, yeah. Gillian Martin. I'm very grateful to Tavish Scott for taking an intervention. Oliver Mundell said that, that people who are talking about this in a negative way and warning as you are doing just now are politicking. Would you say that the people from the Crick Institute are politicking? The, Tavish uh, Scott. Uh, I think uh, the, the uh, staff of the Crick Institute, and, and it's important to recognise again that a thousand of them were surveyed in this work, and that's the reason I want to make about UK science. Uh, far from politicking, we're just not only concerned about their jobs and their futures, but we're also concerned about the very essence of science and why we do it. Uh, and Gillian Martin makes a, 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 draws a fair implication there as to their motive in making these arguments. Just 3% think the scientific community is being listened to and represented in discussions 
and the Institute's director, Paul Nurse, said a hard Brexit could cripple UK science and the government needs to sit up and listen. So far from anyone in this chamber being a negative, it is simply to point out the, and illustrate the depth of concern that exists across the science community, both here in Scotland, but also right across the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. It, how is it right for in, and in the country's interests to turn our back on international people who have worked and lived here, who further our knowledge and our learning, to turn our back on international students by a scandalous approach to immigration that basically says you're not welcome here, and to turn our back on that flowering of ideas that comes from international collaboration and exchange, and therefore here in Scotland to damage the international reach and attractiveness of a major Scottish success story, our strength, strengths in our universities and our world-leading research. The Royal Society set this out with commendable accuracy in their briefing for today's debate. 18% of academic staff in Scotland are EU nationals, a further 13% come from further afield. That is a higher proportion than from any other part of the UK. 25% of staff carrying out only research in Scotland are EU nationals. In engineering technology, that number rises to nearly one half of all the academics employed here in Scotland. So how do those who wish to take us out of Europe propose to attract such talented Europeans to work in Scotland in the future? As we've all been told by anyone who goes to their own universities or their own institutions in their own parts of Scotland, they may just simply choose to work elsewhere. Now, many Scottish institutions, of course, collaborate with European partners, but this has gone backwards since 2016, and it will now get worse. The RSE made the, make the crucial point Notwithstanding UK government reassurances that funding for UK research will not suffer as a result of the UK's withdrawal from the EU, this cannot compensate for the potential loss of the added value gained from full UK, UK participation in EU programmes. That strikes me as the essence of the argument that, and the dangers of what we are about to lose. Horizon 2020 demonstrates this collaboration, as Ian Gray and others have already uh, mentioned. Uh, but few in academia, never mind in politics, believe that a Brexiteer-led UK government will pay one penny more uh, into this programme after 2020 than is being done in the current programme. Imagine trying to convince Prime Minister Dominic Raab to write a cheque to Brussels for anything, never mind for science, in a programme that would support universities in the United Kingdom. Yet this programme has brought all these advantages to Scotland and the UK. And one other point, as well as Scotland's universities, the James Hutton Institute and the SRUC uh, will be directly affected by the lack of access to EU funds. These land-based bodies uh, have been ideally placed to benefit from collaborative funding projects compared to the rest of the UK Scotland's land-based research is simply more joined up from producer uh, to researcher, which makes, it, which makes Scotland internationally useful for collaboration and partnerships in this area. The UK Research Council doesn't do this, and DEFRA has no funds in this area. So what chance of that essential work being re replicated? There appears no obvious upside to dragging the UK and Scotland's higher education sector out of the EU. That is why so many in this sector want a right to vote on whatever cobbled up negotiation appears out of London and Brussels. This parliament should speak for our university and research sector and all the people who work in it, but we should give them a, vote, a right to a vote on it in their future. And that's the amendment I move. I now call on Ross Greer for around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and like colleagues, I'd like to welcome the Minister to his post. It's now almost 20 months since Article 50 was triggered and the UK government has still failed to negotiate what its former Brexit Secretary thought would be the easiest deal in history. It's clear the Prime Minister is paralysed by the infighting in her own party, too scared to take on the hard right ideologues on her back benches and within her cabinet. And one of the many areas of our society which is already suffering the consequences of this bizarre mix of incompetence and malice is our university sector and the wider research and education sectors here in Scotland. We know that membership of the EU brings benefits such as funding and support for international research collaborations, the Erasmus Plus programme and the immense boost that the right to European freedom movement gives to both individuals and to institutions who they work for or with. We can't pick and choose our favourite bits of the EU and hope to retain their full benefits without being a member. That's not how the EU works, which seems to pass the UK government by. But we saw that when Switzerland uh, sought to restrict freedom movement in 2014. Their participation in EU research programmes was then immediately restricted. Funding itself 
can be replaced by the government, though there's little trust in the UK government's commitment to that. But the reputation and prestige that comes with hosting huge EU-funded multinational research projects, that cannot be so easily replaced. Switzerland never even implemented its restrictions on freedom movement. It opted instead to negotiate a new agreement with the EU in return for restoring access to research programmes. Nonetheless, the Vice President for Research of the Swiss Federal Institute of uh, Technology has said that it may take them at least half a decade for Swiss research institutions to recover the standing that they have lost, to re-establish themselves globally. That was from a two-year restriction as a result of a decision which was not implemented. The UK faces full, complete, absolute and permanent or at least long-term removal from European freedom of movement. How can those parties, and it's more than just the Tories, who are committed to ending freedom of movement, reconcile this commitment with their intention to retain access to EU research programmes? Horizon 2020 funding is currently worth over 200 million euros to Scottish research institutes. Research projects are also funded through European structural funds, of which we've received almost a billion in this funding cycle. EU citizens make up more than one in five of the research staff at our universities, and there are over 20,000 students from the rest of the EU currently studying here in Scotland. Now, I appreciate that the UK government has finally, after two years of unnecessary delay, stated that EU citizens' rights to stay in the UK will be secured, even if there is no deal, that provides some relief to EU citizens who are here, but only some. It does not resolve the entirely understandable level of distrust uh, towards the Home Office, given its hostile environment uh, policies and its typically staggering levels of incompetence. Edinburgh University is part of a pilot scheme. Yes, absolutely. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Good. Does he also accept that there is a, 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 a future um, threat from all of this, as the Finance Committee of Parliament pointed out in their report today, that population growth in Scotland is a central aspect of how we meet our economic challenges. And a, and a significant obstacle to population growth will be the hostility towards free movement of individuals uh, as a consequence of the process we're currently going through. Ross Greer. I'm grateful uh, to the Deputy First Minister for making that very relevant point. I'm sure, like colleagues, he heard the evidence that we took last week in the European Committee, where the chair of the UK government's Migration Advisory Committee essentially said that if a sector of our economy was not of high priority, like the financial sector in the City of London, it might just have to restrict itself after Brexit. We repeatedly cited areas of Scotland's economy that are essential to uh, our well-being as a nation, but are also very much dependent on freedom of movement, our ability to attract people in, and they were essentially dismissed as being acceptable casualties of the Brexit process. Now, on the point of Edinburgh University's uh, pilot scheme, this is to register European citizens who are living here in advance uh, of Brexit. It opens this month. Now, I've heard from a number of European citizens who work at Edinburgh University who've told me that they do not intend to take part and they don't know other EU national members of staff who do intend. The reason is complete mistrust of the Home Office. They appreciate their university's support, but they fear that their documents will be lost. They'll be wrongly ordered to leave the country as others have already been. They know the reputation of the Home Office, the racist deportation of citizens from the Windrush generation, the incompetence that has already seen some EU citizens wrongly told to leave the country. And they rightly ask, why be guinea pigs for this department's latest project? I'd also like to take a moment, though, to highlight some of the brilliant benefits in research and training uh, that we get through EU membership, benefits which directly impact communities in the west of Scotland. The University of the West of Scotland certainly benefited from these opportunities. Working with Queen's University in Belfast and Dundalk Institute of Technology in the Republic, they've secured 7.7 .7 million euros to research uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This funding has been used to create the Borders and Regions Airways Training Hub, appropriately acronymed BREF. It employs about 30 research and doctoral students. These are high-level, advanced medical research jobs. Earlier this year, BREATH won a Northern Ireland Healthcare Award for its research into lung disease. This award-winning research project brings immense benefits to the west of Scotland, to Ireland, north and south, and to anyone across the world affected by COPD. The BREATH project, jointly hosted by UWS, is exactly the kind of cross-border, advanced medical research that EU funding makes possible. And while I'm grateful that the UK government excuse me, has guaranteed the current funding cycle, the BREATH project is not under immediate threat, that only lasts for about the next 18 months, where will the next advanced medical research project come from? Will they be able to collaborate across borders and attract the most talented researchers to work on them? 
Of course, EU funding and programmes are not just for people with PhDs doing advanced medical research. West College Scotland benefits immensely from Erasmus Plus, which this Parliament recently debated after a committee inquiry. The College participates in the Enhancing Employability and Skills Through Mobility programme. Partnered with Aarhus Business Network in Denmark and the Vamia Vocational Institute in Finland, the College students get more opportunities to develop their skills abroad and benefit from experiences outside of Scotland. Just this summer, students from the professional cookery course did placement in Aarhus. So next time you're in Paisley or Greenock and you're experiencing some Scandinavian cuisine, which I'm sure is a regular occurrence for members across the chamber, you'll know that those skills come from, uh, you'll know where those skills come from, and that you're, uh, you're appreciating, you're benefiting from an EU programme like Erasmus. The scale and depth of opportunities available to our universities, our colleges and other institutions through research collaboration, funding, exchanges, and that fundamental right to freedom of movement is hard to overstate. And it's immensely frustrating to see that it's at risk. We're fast running out of time, but there is a window in which we can avoid this nonsense and reverse the damage already done. I hope we can seize it. Now move on to the open debate and speeches of six minutes, please. Gillian Martin, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. It's difficult to exactly quantify the impact of Brexit on scientific research in Scotland for a number of reasons. The, the first is that a lot of the reports around this tend to mostly concentrate on UK data. But we do know, as has already been said many times already this afternoon, that Scottish universities punch well above their weight in relation to our nation's size and population. In terms of being successful in garnering EU funding from, for example, Horizon 2020, and have been significant partners in EU collaborative research programmes, particularly in life sciences. And also, we still don't know what kind of Brexit we're looking at, so we can't quantify the effects of, because we don't know what we're actually looking at yet, what migration and visa systems will be in place, what will our customs arrangement going to be. And, and until we have answers to all these questions, the level of damage. Uh, and, it, and it is damage, and uh, I, I think that uh, perhaps rather than just being uh, unrelentingly, blindly positive about things, is actually quite offensive to quite a lot of the academics, for example, that Tavish Scott mentioned, who have actually warned of that damage. It's, it's difficult to quantify it exactly. But let's look at what we do know. We know that 2 billion euros of the 4.8 billion euros that the United Kingdom has won from Horizon 2020 since 2014 has gone to science. 2 billion euros. And we know that Scottish organisations have secured almost 530 odd million uh, worth of uh, funding from Horizon 2020, with three quarters of that going to our universities. And to take just one area of vital research, I went on to the Scottish EU funding portal and I just put in one search, I just put in one search of low carbon, I saw it would come up. One narrow search, I found that 157 current projects are funded by the EU. Now, as everyone here will know, Scotland's committed to being a leader in reducing the causes of uh, climate change. We have to decarbonise. And we have to be at the forefront of renewable energy, agricultural and transport innovation if we're going to achieve that. But also if we're going to have the economy that thrives as a result of the innovation being based here. And that EU funding and collaboration is the bedrock of that innovation. And with the lack of a deal with the EU, we don't know what we can expect, if we can expect to be a non-EU partner in Framework 9, which is obviously the successor, Horizon 2020. Because that door is open to us in the same way that it's open to Norway, Iceland and others um, that are not currently in the EU, if the UK government negotiates access to it. And that, Mr Mundell, is in the national interest. And I'm not hearing anything from that side of the chamber that's saying that we're looking at anything past 2020. We also know that research collaborations between EU parents... Yes, I will. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the member for that for taking the intervention and for that comment but uh, she might want to reflect on the fact that on this side of the chamber we're looking way beyond uh, 2020 we're trying to secure a comprehensive deal with the EU to make sure that we have a smooth and orderly Brexit and we see that as a priority because it's that certainty that will help our institutions here in Scotland. Gillian Martin. I'm happy to give the intervention, even though Mr Mundell never took any of mine, but I tell you, 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 may, you may say that, but I, I can't see many people actually watching this from the scientific and research uh, fraternity having any confidence in any deal that's going to do anything for them. I've just said a way in which we can give them confidence. 
If that's on the table and that's what Mr Mandel's saying, then fair enough. But I don't think that's what he's saying. We are trying to, it's just not good enough. Get on with it. We also know that research collaborations between EU partners have got more, significantly more impact than those standalone domestic ones. The latest UNESCO data shows that 62% of the UK's research outputs are now international collaborations. But the US is only on 39%. And it's that internationalisation, as you know, Ross Greer has mentioned, if you're in a collaboration with lots of other EU partners, then you have a window into this internationalisation. And that puts us uh, as a nation ahead of the US for science productivity. That's significant. And collaborations between universities often lead to opportunities for business collaborations across EU countries as well. Um, and I don't think that can be ignored either. There's a big knock-on effect of universities and research partners working together that affects other sectors too. We also know that being in the EU has afforded not just the free and e easy movement of students, researchers and leads on projects, but it's also made the flow of equipment and samples to facilitate their work seamless and tariff-free. In the autumn of uh, 2016, I was involved in a debate in this chamber about the potential impacts of Brexit uh, research funding. And, and in that debate, I, I read out a, quite a long letter from a PhD research student working in the University of Aberdeen, Samantha Le Summer. Um, remember, this is at a time when the UK government had two years left to negotiate a deal with uh, limit potential negative impacts. And for reference, her letter is in its entirety in the official report from the 6th of October 2016. And I read it back before I wrote my speech, and it's utterly depressing how many of Sam Summer's issues then are still unanswered. In fact, it's not just depressing, it's absolutely scandalous. Samantha is now Dr. Le Summer. She's a postdoctoral research fellow working on the development of cell based treatments for autoimmunity and cancer. And she's working in research that's going to save lives and is world leading in medical innovation. And I got back in touch with her and I just asked, you know, how are things now? And I got another letter back from her and I'd like to read a bit from that now. She said, uh, Hi, Gillian, a lot of damage has already been done. People are leaving. I've witnessed goodbye party after goodbye party as EU scientists in short contracts choose to go home rather than stay here through the uncertainty of Brexit. But UK scientists are also leaving. I myself am currently applying for jobs in the USA and Canada because I cannot plan a career here if there is a hard Brexit or a deal that is bad for my sector, which means we can't collaborate. People don't realise we're not paid by universities. We're paid from the grant money that researchers get. And a huge amount of that is from the EU. The EU has funded over two billion in the UK science, in UK science since 2014. This is the equivalent to around another research council in its entirety. And I, could, I could go on and could pick more up, but I don't have the time. But when, when, I, when I finished in 2016, I said about Sam's uh, original letter, Sam needs answers, Sam's colleagues need answers, and Sam's university needs answers. Will that funding be replaced? Will that collaboration be possible? Will talented EU citizens still be able to study and work in our universities? We're still asking the same questions two years on today. It's an absolute scandal. And I don't think that if anyone for the you research fraternity listen to Oliver Mundell's speech, that they would have got the message that it's just cheer up, gives them any comfort whatsoever. Jamie Green, followed by John McAlpin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start uh, by, uh, from these benches, welcoming uh, the Minister uh, to his role. It's uh, good to see him back in government in that respect. So, uh, and it's an interesting debate. I'm glad he's chosen this subject. I think it's an important one um, because Scotland does have an excellent track record uh, that we should all really be proud of, notwithstanding the environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, we have five universities in Scotland that rank in the global top 200. Uh, this is more per capita than any other country in the world, and that's something that everyone uh, should be proud of. Uh, this is a country where we first cloned a mammal, where the MRI scanner was invented, where uh, our universities uh, support over 180,000 jobs. Uh, so in that respect, I support part of Mr. Lockhead's motion, uh, where he says that, uh, that we should appreciate the significance that our universities and research institutions have in fostering international collaboration and the effect that that has on life here in Scotland. But in today's debate, I also feel it's important to point out that that scientific excellence will continue to operate beyond the realms of a post-Brexit UK. And I say that not to detract from the important point that the government's motion makes today around listening to voices from the science communities. We've heard that 
from many members, and I think that's a fair point to make. But to date, Scottish universities have shown little sign of slowing down since the EU referendum when it comes to their continued participation and involvement on the international stages. Just this week, a group of Scottish universities announced the creation of a Blue Carbon Forum uh, to analyse the way that Scotland's marine life could help mitigate global climate change. Scot Scottish universities came together recently to form uh, the Industrial Centre for Artificial Intelligence, uh, Research and Digital Diagnostics, which is currently working to improve uh, patient care throughout the NHS and also generating jobs in the tech and healthcare sectors. And one example of this comes from my region in the West. The University of West Scotland hosted uh, local uh, first responders for joint training exercises and announced a, a partnership uh, with uh, Kibble Education and Care Centre to support uh, vulnerable uh, youth. They're also working in a, in a number of areas to support uh, getting people into the STEM uh, sectors locally. Uh, and uh, some of those um, uh, examples have uh, uh, came through with their new Lanarkshire campus, which will create a, a vital boost to local jobs and the economy. So the further and higher education sectors are going full steam ahead as best they can uh, in Scotland to promote uh, Scotland as a, a good place to study. Um, but uh, if it's brief, yes. Maureen Watt, uh, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, another university in the west of Scotland, uh, Glasgow University's principal, uh, Sir Anton Muscatelli, said that a hard Brexit would represent the most unhinged example of national self-sabotage in living memory and that we as politicians have a moral obligation to avoid it. How exactly is he wrong? Jamie Green. I I'm very pleased that uh, the member brought that up. So in that sense, can I challenge uh, uh, the member to ensure that her uh, MP colleagues in Westminster do not vote down a deal uh, uh, that would result in a hard deal or a no deal. So I would encourage you to take that to your colleagues because that is a, 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 a real possibility if you do vote down a deal that the Prime Minister brings back from Europe. So please do reflect on that. It's an important point. I'm glad she made it. Uh, part of what has made Scotland a world leader in academia is our resilience and commitment to some of these institutions. Uh, but we cannot, we cannot have this debate and ignore the fact that right now we are seeing fewer and fewer clearing spaces available to Scottish students. Uh, this year, by late August, there were 900 courses available uh, for the rest of UK students and fewer than 150 available for Scottish students due to government quotas. We are regularly warned that universities are in need of funding, as this debate uh, alludes to, to remain financially sustainable and to continue their research. But in fact, nearly half of all Scottish universities are already currently running on a deficit. There's no mention of that in the Minister's motion. There is no mention of that in the Minister's speech today. They talk about the geographic mobility of students, but there's no conversation around the social mobility of students, especially those from Scotland. So let's have a debate about mobility, but we cannot ignore the fact that domestic government has a key role to play in making sure that our higher education institutions are well-placed and well-funded to succeed, regardless of the constitutional or political environments that they operate in. In the limited time that I have available, uh, I would also like to say that uh, Scotland already participates in a number of uh, programmes, uh, the most commonly cited ones such as Horizon uh, and uh, Erasmus uh, are, are, are some, but there are many others, multi-million pound partnerships between Scottish institutions and European counterparts. Uh, many of these uh, ensure that Scotland is a leader in, in these sectors in terms of its des uh, desire to be at the forefront of research and innovation, and it will always keep uh, and remain that uh, desire. But in closing, uh, presiding officer, I think Scottish universities play a pivotal role in our economy and our culture. And our amendment does not hide from the fact uh, that these benches believe that future UK visa structures should continue to allow those institutions to recruit both the staff and the students uh, who are the brightest and the best from wherever they may be. We do need people, but those people also need courses and they need well-funded universities to work and study in. So let's have a sensible debate about the future of Scotland's higher education. But you cannot single out one aspect whilst ignoring others. The Scottish Government 
The Scottish Government has a role to play in this devolved matter, and the lack of awareness of that in their motion today is quite telling, if not entirely predictable. John McAlpine, followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and can I uh, welcome the Minister to his uh, new post and apologise for missing the first couple of minutes uh, of his speech. Uh, I enjoyed what I did here. Uh, within the Brexit debate, it is easy to lose sight of the big picture in the detail of the daily back and forth of negotiations. The futures of all sectors in Scotland is at stake, but the future of our universities in particular will be determined in the months to come. Until now, as others have said, Scotland has more than pulled its weight in cross-border research collaboration and the success of our universities in securing research income and delivering groundbreaking research is testament to this. The figures for the past few years are impressive and as of July 2018, Scottish organisations had secured almost 533 million euros worth of funding from the EU's Horizon 2020 research fund alone. This represents more than 11% of the total UK funding, so we're punching above our weight. And indeed, within walking distance of where we stand, Edinburgh University is the seventh largest individual recipient of Horizon 2020 funds, a, a remarkable achievement, which is, of course, under threat, um, as Brexit backing Tories seem to think that we can simply keep calm and carry on. It's just not good enough. Um, Oliver Mundell and uh, other Conservative speakers have accused us, um, all the other parties, of being too negative about this. But actually, we're just repeating what higher ed educational institutes are telling us. Now, at the moment, the Europe, the Europe Committee of this Parliament is having an inquiry into the Article 50 negotiations and preparedness. And we have received a number of submissions from higher education institutions, which I would urge the Conservatives to read. Uh, one of the most worrying ones was from the University of the Highlands and Islands. And if I could just quote them, they say, the university has worked closely with a wide range of EU higher education institutions over decades. While many still state that their intention is to continue to work with us, irrespective of the final outcome of Article 50 negotiations, some are becoming hesitant about future collaboration. We have had one example of a research partnership where UHI had been proposed the lead applicant, in the, uh, the lead applicant. However, in response to the continuing Article 50 uncertainty, the partnership agreed that the chances of a successful application were greater with a non-UK lead. This is understandable in the highly competitive process of many EU programme applications, but is worrying for the future. And the UHI submission goes on to express concerns about uh, other funding streams, such as the Interreg cross-border programmes. It says there's great uncertainty surrounding future access to such programmes. And they also mention the structural funding, which for an organisation like UHI has been absolutely transformational in their words. There's also another submission from University Scotland, which makes similar points to the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, and I want to quote them in particular in their concerns about UK na uh, EU nationals uh, in uh, the higher education sector, because they're clearly not convinced by any reassurances that the Tories are giving. They, they say in their submission we're seeking clarity on what the residency, work and study rights would be of the, these EU nationals already working, studying or on Erasmus Plus programmes in Scotland, what the immigration rules and requirements will be in place for EU nationals, how the UK government intends uh, underwrites would work in practice, whether Scottish higher education institutions could access replacement parts of their Eyes in 2020 programme and whether Scottish HEIs could access replacement to Erasmus Plus. So they're certainly not reassured by any of the Conservatives' um, bland um, uh, statements about it will be all right on the night. And I wanted to go on to just um, commend the Labour amendment because um, we need to look to the future in this regard and the future is Horizon Europe. Uh, the current proposals for this new scheme are that it will have 20% bigger budget than its predecessor. And as one Commission official 
Riley noted at its launch, the EU27 will gain at our expense in terms of uh, Horizon Europe because we won't be part of it. Uh, this this um, official was quoted as saying, it's not only that the cake is bigger than before, but the guy that was eating more of that cake is not around the table anymore. I suppose we could find grim solace in the fact that at last we have found one example of having your cake and eating it. However, I assume that Leave campaigners did not have that in mind um, for the universities of the EU27 when they coined that phrase. A key part of this new programme will be to foster collaboration, not only across nations, but between industry and academia to tackle the five big challenges we face, health, security, digital, climate and food research. As today's debate takes place, there is still a lively discussion in Brussels about what matters the most and how we need to work together to ensure Horizon Europe delivers on its potential. The UK government has asserted that Scottish universities will still be able to participate in the future, but I do not see the concrete steps towards delivering this. No deal, of course, would be a disaster. After the performance of the Immigration Minister Caroline Noakes last week discussing a no-deal scenario, does anyone seriously think EU nationals would be safe to continue their work in Scotland? That means nearly a quarter of all the research-only staff in Scotland's universities face an uncertain future. Presiding Officer, Scotland deserves better than this. Thank you. David Stewart, followed by Gil Patterson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I also welcome Richard Lockhead to his place and thank him for also agreeing to meet me at very early doors uh, to discuss the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, President Officer, no Friday evening pub quiz is complete without questions about famous Scottish scientists and their inventions. And we all in this chamber today know the easy answers. We all know that John Logie Baird invented TV, that Alexander Fleming invented penicillin, and of course Alexander Graham Bell the telephone. But what if you move to the more challenging level? What about Wilmina Fleming? What about John Napier and Professor John McLeod? I don't see any arms raised in the chamber today, so I assume that ignorance is bliss. And the answers, uh, presiding officer, are a designation system for stars, uh, log tables, and insulin, respectively. Now, we've heard earlier, and I agree with the comments made, that Scotland has a proud record of scientific excellence and international collaboration has been a key factor. Let me give you one example from history. Uh, Professor John McLeod, who I mentioned earlier, an Aberdonian, who emigrated to North uh, America, shared the 1923 Nobel Prize for Medicine with Canadian Frederick Banting for the discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto in 1921-22. Prior to this discovery, and I speak as chair of the cross bar group diabetes, having type diabetes was a life-threatening um, condition. So I warmly welcome the Scottish Government's debate and support uh, the motion in Richard uh, Lockhead's name. I'd like to focus my remarks on the positive note that the EU has played in our universities over the last 45 years through two main focuses on the very brief time that I've got available. The first is the critically important access to research collaborations across the EU and beyond, facilitating what's called in the jargon curiosity-driven research and made easy by freedom of movement um, of our researchers and scientists. And secondly, again, as we've heard from other speakers, the access to major research uh, funding through the various framework funding uh, models. So we've heard a lot about the flagship prize in 2020, and I would agree with what's been said. It's been absolutely crucial in accelerating the cutting-edge science across our university sector and beyond. However, one note of caution, Mr. Um, I was looking at the Guardian newspaper recently, and they were uh, recording a downturn in both UK participation and funding for projects. And there have been cross-the-board concerns from university vice-chancellors that UK projects are losing out even before Brexit has taken place. And I would obviously make the clear point that currently Scotland and the UK does extremely well out of the current system, but nevertheless there's concerns about the current situation post the Brexit vote. Well, let me give you some examples. In 2017, the proportion of UK participation in Horizon 2020 was 15% of the total, with just under 16% of the share of the funding. But if you look at Universities UK figures, they show this year 
that UK participation fell to 12% and funding to 13%. And don't take my word for it, as Alistair Jarvis, the Chief Executive of Universities UK, said, it highlights the urgent need for clarity on the UK's participation in Horizon 2020 beyond Brexit and while the UK is still a member of the EU. The need to communicate with the UK, universities and researchers are still eligible to participate and apply for funding through EC, um, EU research and innovation programmes. But there's also another worrying um, development, President Officer. The Guardian did a confidential study of the Russell Group Universities. Members will know that uh, that includes um, Edinburgh and Glasgow Universities. They found evidence, and we've heard this from previous speakers, of discrimination against UK researchers um, by um, UK researchers being asked to leave EU-funded projects. Let me give you an example. In a quote by The Guardian, an EU project officer recommended that a lead investigator drop all UK partners from a consortium because Britain's share of funding is not guaranteed. Another key aspect, of course, is freedom of movement. And we all know that is a fundamental to the EU. Now, my belief is that Scotland has benefited from the ability to attract world-leading scientists and embark on global research opportunities because of its membership of the EU. But the other aspect is given our early career researchers an opportunity to travel freely across the EU and develop new ideas and products with their peers and bring the knowledge back to Scotland. I think it was Tavish Scott earlier mentioned the letter in the Sunday Times um, by leading academics from across Scotland. And what they said, and I quote from the letter, uh, we cannot and must not allow Scotland and the EU as leading role in these networks as it's not easily replaced. Unfortunately, we're already seeing a loss of leadership in research collaboration since the Brexit vote. And also, I think it is useful to look at total funding. If we look at um, total awards from the previous programme, that was Framework Programme 7, that predated Horizon 2020, it was 729.5 million. And if we look at my own region, um, help towards UHI of 3 million euros for marine and renewable research. These projects make a real difference to innovation across the region. Very often, they build on a platform of major structural fund investment over the last three decades, which made such a difference to my region's economy. There's, of course, plans to develop in key sectors, such as renewables and health sciences, uh, but the remainder of Horizon 2020 programme and the future Horizon um, Europe activity, but these have been very limited as a result of Brexit. I see that time is against me, President Officer, so in the few seconds remaining, I would make this very key point that you probably need the protective powers of the brand seer uh, to develop the next steps in the Brexit process. But I would conclude by saying this, that the challenge for Scotland in the future is twofold. We need to maintain the spend on research and use every technique to secure the best and brightest talent from across Europe and beyond. Brexit casts a dark shadow, but by using our own history of innovation and scientific endeavour, we will continue to create new knowledge for generations yet unborn. Thank you. All speakers uh, so far have had a bit of leeway, but we have to be a bit tighter now with our speeches up to the six minutes. And I call Gil Patterson, followed by Alexander Stewart. Hey, many thanks, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, like most members of the Scottish Parliament, you will be aware of the world-acclaimed repu repu reputation of the Golden Jubilee National Hospital in Clydebank. <coughs> Although the hospital prov provides a wide range of services, it's best known as the home of the regional and national heart and lung service, a flag flagship hospital for reducing waiting times and the Golden Jubilee Research Institute. <coughs> On the research side of the hospital's work, significant pharmaceutical research projects have been undertaken. Currently, there are 23 projects underway, with 10% of the research funding coming directly from the EU and with 30% of the staff at the Golden Jubilee non-UK citizens. Then the Golden Jubilee National Hospital is truly an international undertaking located in Scotland. Indeed, many overseas medical researchers are drawn to the Golden Jubilee Hospital because of the superb facilities and the high rep reputation of the previous work undertaken. The Golden Jubilee is also one of the biggest employers in my constituency. Currently, there are more than 1,700 staff employed by the hospital. 
in plans to extend the building and its facilities and increase the staff levels to 2,900 are well advanced. Unfortunately, Brexit has already had a negative effect on the hospital's workload. California Medical Research Group, Ricardio, have recently halted trials on the new heart's a, a drug, citing uncertainty due to EU withdrawal. Whilst drug trial work is UK in UK hospitals have indeed been cancelled by Ricardio, they have continued at other continental European uh, places. The major problem seems to be the medicines regulations post-Brexit. It is not certain that data generated in the UK will be accepted by the European Medicines Agency, and that means all internationally funded medical research in the UK is now under threat. My constituent, Dr Kevin Parsons, a biodivers biodiversity lecturer at Glasgow Uni University, is preparing what is likely to be his final European research application. This grant, amounting to €2 million, Euros, which is Research Group's biggest fund uh, funder, and has provided continuity for his research projects for several years. You can imagine how damaging the loss of this funding will be. Already European research not networks, which foster collaboration work across the EU, are dropping their UK partners because of Brexit uncertainty. The fact that the UK pays in less for European research than it actually gets back suggests that there will be a significant loss to the UK research industry after Brexit. And of course, foreign boss, born academics will follow the money. Today, the UK uh, Home Office uh, have been less than helpful to Scotland in retaining the high quality of foreign born academics we need to keep our research and development in industry at the forefront of world achievement. Sure. Miles Briggs. I, I thank the member for taking this intervention. I, along with committee members from the Health and Sport Committee, uh, visited the Golden Jubilee and saw the excellent facilities there. What they told us was actually, as much as uh, this is around medical staff recruitment, which is a responsibility of his government, I wonder if he had any comments around that, given the shortage we have in specialists. Gil Patterson. Well, I, th I, I think you're trying to conflate two things at the same uh, into something, because clearly... Clearly at the Golden Jubilee, and if, if you let me finish this, you'll see the impact that this is actually already having. And I'm just going on to, to explain a bit further uh, from a, a, an individual from my own constituency uh, the, the damage that's likely to happen uh, in, in the future. Last year, the same constituent, Dr Kevin Parsons, a Canadian-born academic at Glasgow University, came face to face with the mindless and insensitive bureaucracy that is the Home Office. Dr Parsons came to Scotland under his wife's UK ancestry visa in 2012. When she applied for UK citizenship, Dr Parsons was advised to apply for indefinite leave to remain in the UK. This would, would uh, now re uh, require to, be, uh, to, uh, to c continue his, uh, his work. His application was refused on a technicality. At Glasgow University, Dr Parsons managed a research group which employed two highly educated research, researchers, including three proscribes working for their PhDs. Dr Parsons attracted external research funding which paid for the whole research group. This both enhanced Glasgow University's, University's research reputation and assisted with the university's finances in general. To make things worse, a few weeks earlier, Dr Parsons had received £1.3 million grant from the UK government to continue his research and at the same time they threatened his right to stay in Scotland. Fortunately, after a substantial public outcry, Dr Parsons was granted indefinite leave to remain. This example of the Home Office incompetence could have resulted in closure of the biodiversity research group at Glasgow University, the loss of substantial research funding in Scotland, the loss of three well-paid and highly skilled research jobs, the loss of, a, of, a study, of study opportunities for three post-grad students, the deportation of a young family who, are much, who have much to offer Scotland, 
and that's only just one project, all of which would have harmed Scottish society and the, this incompetence happened before Brexit. With a no deal result on Brexit negotiations, the prospects for international research collaboration and the Scottish research industry will be sorely damaged. With a no deal, Scotland will lose significant EU funding, international medical research funding, worldwide re reputation for excellence research and academic achievement, postgraduate opportunities, the ability to properly staff our hospitals and our research establishments and much more. It is essential, therefore, that the UK remains in the customs union and the single market after Brexit. That's the only way, presiding officer, that Scotland's research industry will be able to survive mm -hmm. at its present level. Thank you. Alexander Stewart, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to take part in today's debate on the future of Scotland's international research collaborations because the sector has done so much already and we should be rightly proud of what it has achieved to date and will, con will continue to achieve in the future. Scotland is, is renowned for its innovative scientific research and much of the success has been a result of international collaborations, both individuals and institutions with EU members and from around the world. And I can look at my own region, Deputy Prime Officer, across Mid-Scotland and Fife and see so much that has been achieved and that is being achieved within some of these institutions. Uh, and I pay tribute to many of them who are, who are world leading uh, in that sector. And I am confident that that will continue once we leave the EU. While EU funding is, of course, uh, very important and very much welcome, uh, we should note that the £105 million pound that Scottish universities received from EU in 2016-17 accounts for 13.5% of the total research income. In fact, the vast majority of research funding uh, came from UK sources, totalling a value of £630 million. This is a massive contribution, uh, and that happens because we are seen as having such high regard uh, for the facilities that we have, uh, and as I've said, that will continue. The UK government has been able to provide some welcome reassurances to research institutions by committing and to guarantee research funding that will already be there and it's promised until 2020. Moreover, the financial settlement... Yes, happy to give way. John Mason. Except that 2020 is actually not that far ahead. Uh, Alexander Stewart. I thank the member for the intervention. Yes, I, I am well aware that 2020 is not that far ahead, but it is the, the starting blocks and we will continue to move forward uh, as, as we uh, see the success that's gained. As I said, moreover, uh, the financial settlement that has been agreed between the UK and the European Commission, both the UK and the EU, have agreed that the eligibility of UK researchers and businesses in participation in Horizon 2020 will remain unchanged for the duration of the programme. While this indeed is very good news in the short term until 2020, we need to ensure that we continue to have strong working relationships with research institutions in the EU after 2020. And the very point uh, uh, that the member makes is that we will continue to do that. There is every possibility that we will continue and we will have uh, the participation in the programme as a third uh, country, just as many non-EU countries do at the current uh, Horizon 2020 programme. And that needs to become a reality. We need to ensure that we have that safeguard in place to ensure that after 2020, that does become a reality. Moreover, in the white paper for the future relationship with the EU Union and the UK, government proposed close cooperation between the UK and the EU on scientific research and cooperation of accords. These seem to continue to participate in the UK's research funding programme and will allow us to continue to have that cooperation on networks, on institutions, on infrastructures, on agencies and on regulators, where there is mutual benefit to the UK and the EU. It is, of course, incredibly important that the best and brightest researchers from the EU are able to be here and from other parts around the world. And we can, we can look at what we've achieved so far, Deputy Presiding Officer, in having these individuals who are here who make a massive contribution to these facilities, and they will continue that. Currently, 19% of researchers in Scotland are from the EU and 16 are from other parts of the world. So there's an opportunity for that to continue to grow and that to continue to blossom. It's also reassuring to hear that the EU, 
uh, the UK government has been able to confirm the EU citizens' rights of residency after Brexit will be guaranteed, which includes uh, the, as many researchers that already are here. So we are attempting to ensure that safeguards are already in place before we get to that, to ensure that that does take place, because that is what we require to see. And I'm, and I'm confident uh, that as we go forward, we will ensure that that is very much the case. And we need to look at uh, the visa system that we have allowed uh, for universities to secure the highest calibre of researchers uh, within these institutions. And I would call on the UK government to keep this in mind as we shape a new uh, immigration system following from the departure of the EU. I'd like to continue some progress. Dear Presiding Officer, we in the Scottish Conservatives recognise the incredible value that scientific research makes to a, a world-leading sector, and we must continue to be that world-leading sector. We've already heard that we punch above our weight here in Scotland, and that has very much been the case. And as I said, I know that that will continue uh, because we have individuals, organisations and institutions who want to ensure that that takes place. We understand the importance of getting a good deal for the European Union to ensure continued international research cooperation and collaborations do take place. And I am confident that the UK government will achieve this as we move forward. The benefits economically, the benefits socially, and the benefits culturally are considerable, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I support the amendment in Oliver Mundell's name. Thank you. John Mason, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you uh, very much. We seem to have debated uh, Brexit in this chamber and in committees for a fairly long time. However, like it or not, we still need to focus on the implications, uh, both of the actual barriers that may spring up, but also the impact on reputation, which is important too. Sadly, this kind of impact in our universities and wider science and research communities was not carefully considered before the EU referendum vote. And like other areas, it has become increasingly clear at both the economy and rec committees, which I am on, that many, many sectors, including today's, are being seriously impacted by Brexit. Because whatever the intentions of the people voting for Brexit were, the message has gone out and continues to go out that the UK is isolationist and does not welcome foreigners. Freedom of movement is probably the key factor for today's debate, and several people have mentioned it already. We want students to come here and study while we want our, our students can go to the best institutions around the world. We want top academics and researchers to make their home here, or at least to freely move around the world uh, and round universities, including our own. Uh, yes? Miles Briggs. Uh, uh, member for that intervention, I think we'd all agree with that. Where does he then square that view with regards to Scottish medical students? Because as things stand today under his government, only 50% of Scots are getting to study medicine at Scottish medical schools, down from 75% since his party came to power. John Mason. Well, I think, I mean, still with visas and all the rest of it, be it for medical students or any other students, that is still controlled, as I understand it, by the Home Office. And we certainly want more... Uh, students uh, and certainly more foreign students to come here uh, as well as our students uh, should be able to study uh, overseas. Now it's clear that Scotland's universities as others have said and their research is very much at the top end. 77% of Scotland's university research is deemed as world leading or internationally excellent. Both Richard Lockhead and Ian Gray have referred to figures such as th that nine of Scotland's universities are ranked in the top 200 eh, and also that Scotland really is second in the world for top universities per head of population only marginally after Switzerland. Many examples have been given of eh, funding, one being the Horizon 2020 case study of the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia. The University of Edinburgh is involved with public and private sector organisations across Europe. At a UK level too, there has been great benefit from EU research projects. From 2007 to 13, the UK contributed some 5.4 billion euros and got back some 8.8 .8 billion. Comments from Glasgow's five medical schools are telling. Chances to lead international collaborations and clinical trials could be lost, so our world-class reputation could suffer. It's not just about funding, they say. Concerns about connectivity and addressing major healthcare questions via multi-populations could be lost. There is potential jeopardy of networks and collaborations which take years to formulate. 
and we're already seeing a loss of leadership in research collaborations since the Brexit vote, as others have mentioned. We can thank the Royal Society of Edinburgh for their briefing for today's debate, and they argue along similar lines. They talk about the complementarity of UK and EU research funding system, having made the UK an excellent place to have a research career. They emphasise it is necessary for the UK to attract and retain the highest quality staff from across the globe, as well as continuing to develop the domestic skills base. Again, Tavish Scott mentioned figures such as 18% of academic staff in Scotland are from the EU, 31% in total are non-UK, and in particular engineering and technology, that rises to 46%. 22% of students at Scottish universities are international students. The RSE also makes the point that researchers and innovators want and need to work with the best in their field. So even if the UK government maintains funding for UK research, we would also still lose full UK collaboration, uh, participation in EU programmes, especially the benefits of collaborative activity and the critical mass which the EU gives. They call for full participation in Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, but warn that associated status for the UK may be the only option and that this is very uncertain and unpredictable territory. They also seek a proportionate and flexible immigration policy, taking into account the needs and circumstances of the devolved na nations. And as I think, as we've discussed here before, the RSE considers that students should be removed from the net migra migration target and the post-study work visa should be available for international students at universities. To move on to a specific sector, I wanted to mention the space industry in Scotland and particularly Glasgow's satellite sector. Scotland's space industry is reckoned to generate around £1 billion for the economy and supports 20,000 jobs. Glasgow produces more satellites than any other city outside the USA. Scotland's first satellite was only launched four years ago by Clyde Space, while we also have Alba Orbital and Spire Global operating in the city. The Strathclyde Space Institute is at the University of Strathclyde, and they currently have seven H2020 projects with a total value of 25 million euros. Now, the European Space Agency is distinct from the European Union, so the UK could leave the European Union and remain a member of the European Space Agency. However, my understanding is that it would not be eligible to participate in programmes funded by the EU, so that would be a problem. Uh, presiding officer, if I've got no leeway, then I shall finish. Thank you very much, Mr. Mees. Claire Baker, followed by Maureen Wood. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate this afternoon. Many of us have universities in our constituencies and regions, and I have uh, St Andrews University and the University of Stirling. And I graduated with a degree from the University of Edinburgh before getting a doctorate with the University of Glasgow. And my undergraduate roommate was from America, and I studied for a PhD alongside a student from Turkey. And we have seen that despite being a small country in terms of population, we have an impressive number of excellent universities and research institutions that attract talent from overseas. We have seen the ability for Scotland to lead on research and innovation and to work in a collaborative manner with other universities, especially those within the European Union and Scotland punches above its weight. In December 2017, Universities UK highlighted the vital contribution EU staff make to UK universities with their Bright Minds campaign. It included a collection of case studies highlighting the research and stories of leading EU academics, including in Scotland, working in UK universities. It illustrated the world-class research carried out by European staff in the UK and how this could be hindered by further Brexit uncertainty. Today's debate focuses on scientific excellence. In 2015-16, 59% of EEA staff worked in departments defined by HESA as science, engineering or technology, all positive areas for growth in our economy. I am sure that academics in members' regions have been raising these concerns and that the Chamber this afternoon is well aware of the potential impact of Brexit on our higher and further education sector. Many of the speakers today also took part in the debate held by the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee following our inquiry into Erasmus+. Plus. Despite the fact the debate took place in May and we have seen continuous negotiations since then, many of the concerns still apply today. The future of Erasmus+, Plus, along with Horizon Europe, will have a significant impact on our further and higher institutions and our leading research institutions. 
The committee's report into Erasmus Plus found that many organisations and sectors are particularly reliant on the funding and opportunities this programme provides. Losing their ability to participate could have a significant impact. The committee found that the Department for Exiting the European Union had failed to produce any analysis into the role and value of Erasmus Plus. In light of the lack of activity from the UK Government, we therefore urge the Scottish Government to consider such analysis for Scottish institutions and explore the possibility of using existing structures such as Education Scotland or British Council Scotland to develop a framework for continued participation beyond 2020. I note the Conservative amendment today highlights the decision taken by the Prime Minister to commit to continued membership of Erasmus Plus until 2020, but that is only a year's extension. Our universities have to be able to commit to forward planning beyond that, and I hope the Minister can outline what um, work the Government have undertaken to explore other options uh, during his closing remarks. There is no doubt, just as Brexit risks the future of Erasmus+, Plus, so too does it risk the ability and ease with which collaborative research is currently carried out. Horizon 2020 funding accounts for hundreds of projects across 89 collaborating countries and over 2,000 organisations. Scottish HEIs receive 13% of the UK share and it accounts for 9% of our total research funding. This funding is vital and we must find ways to continue to contribute to and benefit from its successor programme, Horizon Europe. <laughs> University of Scotland make it clear that if Scotland is to retain its outstanding reputation for delivering world-class research with worldwide impact, then membership of Horizon Europe is essential. And it must go beyond simply being members. It must be about informing the programme's development and ensuring our universities and researchers are able to take advantage of the grants, the networks and the data available. This will be difficult as we become a third partner. Until we have a deal or at least guarantees from Westminster and Brussels of the UK's continued involvement, there is, as with Erasmus, limited scope for our universities to be able to forward plan. We also must heed the warning of leading academics who last month wrote an open letter of the dire consequences that is facing Scottish higher education with Brexit. Brexit and in particular the ending of free movement risks the already well-established cooperation opportunities open to academics, researchers, students and scientists. Moreover, as much as our students want to go to Milan or Barcelona to learn and work, students from across Europe see Scotland as a popular destination of choice and want to come here to learn in our renowned and respected universities and research facilities. We should not be closing a door on the collaborative work that can drive research and benefit the country as a whole. Last week, Professor Alan Manning, Chair of the UK Government's Migration Advisory Committee, gave evidence to the Culture Committee. I have to say it did not fill me with confidence. In the group's recent report on international students, they lay out in no uncertain terms the impact of Brexit on students in our universities, stating that they do, not, they do not, though, see any upside for the sector in leaving the EU. Any barriers to student mobility are likely to have a negative impact. It is therefore disappointing, despite acknowledging this, that the MAC explicitly called for the UK Government not to introduce a separate post-study work visa. The Fresh Talent Initiative, introduced by Jack McConnell and the Labour-led executive, had a clear positive impact on student recruitment and retention. I was part of the cross-party group that was brought together by the then Minister Hamza Youssef that recently lobbied the UK Government for its reintroduction. We were united in that approach. We were clear that due to Scotland's slower population growth, the need to expand our workforce and the existing skills shortages in certain sectors, that providing opportunities for non-EU international graduates in Scotland is vital. The ending of free movement for EU students would make this even more acute. According to University of Scotland, over 12% of staff from Scotland's HEIs and 16% of their postgraduate research population are from the EU. Scotland's EU workforce is young and concentrated in academic roles, particularly in science. Presiding offer, just in closing, I would like to say that the Migration Advisory Committee Chair last week talked about the UK Government's ambition for a high skills, high wage economy. To achieve that, surely knowledge exchange and increasing intellectual capacity is key, and success in these areas relies on international engagement. The needs of the university and research sectors must be listened to and positively responded to if we are not to avoid damaging such an important sector. Maureen Watt, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also welcome Richard Lockhead to his new role. Presiding Officer, in July 2017, a report from the Centre for Cities at the U London School of Economics 
found that Aberdeen could be the worst hit city in the UK as a result of Brexit. Their analysis concluded that under a hard Brexit, economic output will go down by 3.7% or under a soft Brexit will be reduced by 2.1%. So while just over 61% of the people of Aberdeen remote, voted to remain in the EU, this is the stark reality facing my constituents because Scotland is being taken out of the EU against its will. So Mr Mundell, I know where my interests lie. It is with my constituents. The University of Aberdeen, which over the years has built a strong reputation as a research intensive university with a strong international outlook, sees that it is, and I quote, extremely concerned about the impact that Br Britain's exit from the European Union will have on our research, student recruitment, and the learning experience we offer. Obviously, the possibility of a no-deal Brexit heightens these risks further. In February 2018, the then Principal and Vice-Chancellor, Sir Ian Diamond, stated at a Westminster reception that the UK government needs to clarify the rights of higher education EU citizens and their families to live and work in the UK, but not just for lecturers, but also for other higher education staff, such as language assistants and technicians. We are now in November and edge closer to a no-deal outcome as each day passes. We have no further idea of what the future brings for EU nationals living in our communities. The issue of citizenship and the right to remain, of course, extends beyond people who study or work in higher education. Like myself, I'm sure other M MSPs in this chamber have had EU nationals contacting their offices seeking advice about Brexit. My constituency office window is full of adverts for upcoming EU citizenship events and is regularly updated as new events are announced. And Tavish Scott mentioned Torrey Marine Laboratory, very near my constituency office, which has many Europeans among its staff. As a result of Brexit, higher education ed institutions stand to lose talented students, devoted staff and vital access to EU funding programmes such as Horizon 2020, now known as Horizon Europe. On the latter point, retaining access and membership of Horizon Europe was described as essential by University of Scotland and should be a priority for the UK government, according to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I myself was involved some years ago on the Gilded Project through the James Hutton Institute, which Tavis Scott also mentioned, which uh, is cited in my, or has one of its sites in my uh, constituency. And that was an inter, uh, a pan-European project that involved um, collaborating with uh, institutions in Poland and the Netherlands. And we're all fearful of the uncertainty, which is already damaging. In the event that access to such funding is lost, I understand that Universities UK is continuing to lobby the UK government to set up contingency plans for replacing them. And perhaps the UK government could use some of the supposed 350 million a week savings that was emblazoned on the leave buses to help in this, but I'm not holding my breath. We can be proud that nine of Scotland's universities are in the global top 200 for international outlook, demonstrating our appeal to students and academics from across the world. As a result of Brexit, our universities stand to lose both the opportunity to collaborate with other universities across Europe and lose students who are worried about their rights to study here. UCAS statistics have noted that EU students coming to Scotland fell by 10% in 2017. And who can blame them for being worried about the implications of Brexit and what it could mean for their right to study at our universities? It sends out the wrong message that they are unwelcome, when the truth is Scotland has always welcomed EU citizens and beyond with open arms. Presiding Officer Ross Greer and others mentioned the importance of the Erasmus programme, championed, of course, by Winnie Ewing when she was a member of the European Parliament. I can say that my daughter benefited hugely from her year abroad and is now bilingual and working in Paris. I brought my children up to believe that the world was their oyster. Little did I believe that I'd be telling them a lie. 
Our loss is other European universities' gain. The UCL Centre for Global Higher Education reported that it became evident in February 2018 that European universities have used the uncertainty of Brexit to poach UK-based academics, with Germany in particular standing to benefit. Their report notes that Germ Germany sees Brexit as a window of opportunity to attract UK-based researchers. Ironic, isn't it, considering the relentless promises of opportunities of Brexit we hear from the Conservative government. The real opportunities could be grasped by remaining in the European single market and the customs union. It would avert the need to consider any sort of contingency planning to protect our valued educational institutions from the damaging consequences of Brexit. Instead, not only is our higher education sector facing threats, but also, as we now know, the very being of the Scottish Parliament is being threatened by this shameful Tory Westminster government. Thank you. I call Rachel Hamilton to be... For, to, sorry, we move to closing speeches after that. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we've heard so much today about the vital work that our UK and Scottish research institutions carry out. It's world-leading, um, from the Fraunhofer Institute at the University of Strathclyde to the first International Max Planck Institute partnerships. Scotland has a long history, we've heard it from all our members today, and reputation of scientific prowess, with the potential to be so much more in the future. These benches welcome the recent news that Glasgow will be the home to the 15.8 million Artificial Intelligence Health Research Centre as part of the UK government's plan to utilise the AI in the healthcare sector. It's a major boost for Scotland's uh, life sciences sector um, and the Industrial Centre for Artificial Intelligent Research and Digital Diagnostics to be known as iCared. It will examine how AI can enable better patient diagnosis, treatment and outcomes. And Anna Dominikzak, Vice Principal and Head College of um, Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences at the University of Glasgow said the formation of iCared is a great coup for Scotland and its people and further positions Scotland's ability to be a global leader in precision medicine. The iCared uh, epitomises sorry, our triple helix approach to healthcare innovation and precision medicine by developing research and innovation concurrently in industry, the NHS and academia. And she goes on to say that by locating at the Clinical Innovation Zone at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital alongside partners in the industry and the NHS, iCared will also drive open innovation and encourage further industry uh, collaborations. And we're all proud, we've heard that today, we're all proud of the reputation um, of the research which Scotland's institutions conduct and produce. 77% of Scotland's university research is deemed world leading or internationally excellent. In addition to this, 85.9% of Scottish research is judged to have an outstanding or very considerable impact on the economy, society and culture beyond academia. The motion today highlights the challenges we do face, but also fails to acknowledge perhaps the great potential and positivity which we all must work towards as we move towards leaving the European Union. Presiding officer, it's been mentioned before, and we all know that currently, until the date when the UK leaves the EU, EU we have the reassurance that we remain a member state with all the rights and obligations that that entails. And this means that the UK entities are eg eligible to participate in all aspects of Horizon 2020 programme. Uh, until we uh, of course, leave the EU. And uh, J John Mason, I think it was, mentioned that it isn't long to 2020. Um, and, you know, uh, moving forward, we do need to support a deal specifically for this sector. Um, looking forward to the future, um, it is also significant that the UK government has signalled commitment um, for our country and the world through our goal to increase UK research and development spending to 2.4% of GDP by 2027. 27. Um, just to reiterate the point there about our commitment to Horizon 2020 um, funding, um, it was mentioned by Alistair Jarvis, who's Chief Executive of Universities UK. Um, he backed this commitment and he said that the extension of the UK government's underwrite until the end of the Horizon 2020 programme is welcome news. And w I think we all welcome it. Um, but of course, he, he also mentioned that it is um, guaranteed even if there is a no deal scenario, which of course we don't want. And we want everyone to get behind 
uh, a UK government deal and behind the Prime Minister. Um, moving on, um, the UK government has proposed post-Brexit cooperation between the UK and the EU in the sciences and the, and the UK government's white paper on our future relationship with the EU includes science and innovation among the areas that will be covered by uh, cooperative accords to replace our current relationship um, with the EU. As we leave the EU, inevitably, um, freedom of movement will end. Um, however, the UK government has made it clear a flexible system will be put in place to attract the brightest and the best research students and researchers. And nevertheless, no matter what members on the other side of this ch chamber um, try to uh, spin or put a negative angle on, we know that EU citizens' rights um, of residence after Brexit are guaranteed. And let us be really clear about it. The UK government has introduced the settled status scheme, so EU citizens will have this right and can remain in the UK after 2020. I'll just finish this point, if you don't mind, and then I'll take the intervention. Um, the UK government is also proposing the continuation of cultural exchange exchange programs for students and the creation of a UK EU mobility scheme. Um, John Swinney uh, earlier mentioned the post-work visa um, scheme and it's something that Liz Smith has been championing. Um, um, we haven't had a definitive no but we would like to continue to um, support that. I'll take Joan McAlpine's intervention. Joan McAlpine. Thank you and I thank the member for taking my intervention. She has given assurances that her colleagues have on um, the status of EU citizens, but why then has the submission of University Scotland to the, the Parliament's Europe Committee raised so many questions about the status of EU citizens? Clearly, EU, uh, University Scotland are not convinced by these reassurances. Rachel Hamilton. Well, I mean, perhaps uh, they haven't actually read about the settled status because, actually, well, honestly, it is absolutely, it has been said and it has been said time and time again um, that uh, there is a settled status and that will be, that's a reassurance to those people that they'll be able to stay in the UK post-Brexit. Um, and uh, I just want to say on that point um, also is that within... We've got to be careful within the scientific research roles that actually um, there are many uh, people from the European Union here. There's 19 percent. Um, we've also got about 67 percent from the rest of the UK. So we need to look at um, how we make sure that we have lots and lots of um, excellent, the brightest and the best researchers and that, and that we continue to get behind that, not only from the rest of the UK, but um, from the EU and non-EU countries. Um, and what we can do is absolutely get behind that. And I think that Joan McAlpine should be reassuring the Scottish universities as well on that point. But in my closing remarks, presiding officer, I want to reiterate the point that Brexit is not the end point of the UK and Scotland's great scientific research. And as the government motion suggests, um, the negativity and lack of cooper cooperation from this government on Brexit matters is stifling um, the progress of what Scotland and the UK can achieve. The interventions that we receive continually from backbenchers is so negative. It's a grievance agenda uh, and it's just not um, a positive approach to look at it. We have such potent potential here. We have, um, you know, the brightest and the best, but we want to attract more. And it's just a shame that the SNP cannot see that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move now to closing speeches. I call on Tavish, Gray, Tavish Scott to be followed by Ian Gray. Tavish I'm not sure, uh, starting off, sir, that too many on the Conservative benches have read the briefings that came from University of Scotland and from uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, or indeed from uh, the individual uh, institutions, uh, the number that Joan McAlpine mentioned, who've been giving evidence to the uh, Europe Committee in preparation of the debate. But it would do them well to do so. But to help Miles Briggs, because I suspect we're all Miles has got to do the wind-up for the Conservative benches uh, today, I dug out the Edinburgh University statistics, given he's one of our Lothian members. Of course, Edinburgh University has participated in more than 300 European collaborative projects uh, and in the current uh, year has received something in the order of £403 million for new research grants. Uh, that's European Union uh, research uh, grants. And since 1987, the university has spent, uh, sorry, has sent more than 12,000 students to Europe. So I'm sure... Um, uh, in his wind-up, uh, Mr Briggs will want to uh, consider the, the impact on uh, Edinburgh University, never mind Harriet Watt or Napier or Edinburgh University or the others that are here in the capital city uh, of, uh, uh, of Scotland. Daniel Johnson. 
to that list that not only are, are those records uh, notable, but Edinburgh is one of the biggest recipients, not just in Scotland, of European research funding, but in the whole of the UK. Tavish Scott. Their endless modesty, Edinburgh University doesn't actually mention that in their briefing note, but I, I'll entirely take uh, uh, Daniel Johnson's uh, uh, point uh, on that. Uh, and the other two points, I, two points I wanted just to briefly make to the Conservative benches are that there's been some mention of an inability to look way beyond 2020. I thought to begin with that was a wonderful new pitch for a new timescale on the uh, transition period uh, earlier on. But actually the point about 2020 is the Horizon Project. Uh, there is nothing guaranteed post-2020, uh, nothing whatsoever. And that is why Edinburgh University and others have been able to garner the extent of research funding that they have over the uh, years. It's not the, it's not the guarantee of funding uh, until 2020, it's what happens after that. And anyone who asks questions about this area finds out, uh, in a minute, anyone who asks questions uh, uh, of universities and finds out about this finds out the time it takes to put these projects together is, is now till 2020. And that is the danger that Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK's academic institutions face. And if Jamie Green's got an answer to that, I'll happily give way. Jamie Green. Jamie Green. Thanks, yeah, well, thank, th thank you. Uh, and thank, thanks to uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, you're right. We, we do need to look beyond 2020. Um, I, I know that the UK uh, minister on this uh, made a, 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 an announcement recently that he is having a very active and positive discussion with the EU about it. And I think the question is around uh, how much uh, the UK should pay into it and what access they get in return. It's a very valid uh, negotiation to have in the context of it. But I am enthused that there is a positive conversation happening after 2020. Tavishkaj. Well, we'll all look forward uh, to that, uh, presiding officer. Academics and the student body are part, of course, of a society most in favour of a rational evidence-based opportunity to explore and then test the merits of whatever deal emerges from the Brexit negotiations. Parliament can, of course, today support that position. Today could be a significant moment for the Scottish Parliament and the UK-wide campaign to stop a calamitous Brexit. On three previous occasions, only these benches have voted for a referendum on the terms of the deal. Today, that outcome could be very different indeed. I welcome the support of the SNP and the Greens, and there are more and more senior figures in other parties adding their voice too. Indeed, amongst the Conservatives, we have notable figures such as the former Prime Minister John Major, Justin Greening, Heidi Allen, and Sarah Wollaston. Not many obsessives there, I suggest. Uh, we also know that the overwhelming majority of Labour supporters in Scotland don't agree with a pro-Brexit policy. Senior figures such as Sadiq Khan, Chukka Anuna and Ian Murray have led that charge and I know there are many reasonable people on the Labour benches here today who consider that position needs to change as well. So there's a very real momentum now and a demonstrable shift in attitudes in every corner of the UK. Uh, last month, we witnessed the second biggest public demonstration in Britain in the last century, 700,000 people. Can I finish these points? 700,000 people, only surpassed by the protest against the Iraq war. Nobody voted for the current chaos. They're entitled to have their final say on that deal whenever London and Brussels conclude it. That's what should happen, and Parliament should vote for that today. Many academics think their MSP should be doing exactly that. Which brings me to the examples that were made today in a range of areas, particularly on the immigration system. Uh, Joan McAlpine, Ross Greer, and a number of others mentioned the UK Migra Migration Advisory Committee of the UK Government and their recommendations. But the point that the RSE uh, make in their briefing today, which I think is important and does bear uh, close examination on the point that Jamie Green makes about trying to find a way forward, is that they, ha they have strongly pushed uh, in collaboration or in support rather of uh, many parliamentary committees both in uh, London and in Edinburgh that the UK Government should remo remove, remove student migration from the net migration target to make it clear it wants talent to come to the UK. Coupled with this, it should reintroduce the post-study work visa for international students at all universities. Taking those actions together, presiding officer, would alleviate the tension between the UK government's commitment to reduce net migration and its ambition to ensure the UK government remains a hub for international talent. Well, we all uh, await that outcome. Many have been pushing for that for some uh, considerable time, and we are long overdue a very sensible outcome to what is an unanswerable case uh, supporting both uh, academic institutions and the student bodies here in Scotland, but also right across the UK. I wanted to, to reflect on two comments that are specifically made in the Nobel Law 
laureate's letter that uh, I mentioned earlier on. Uh, the first is that uh, they say in their uh, letter to the Prime Minister that Europe was the home of the Enlightenment and the birthplace of modern science, but partly as a result of two devastating wars in Europe, it suffered a relative decline. And they also then go on to argue how that has changed and how the benefits that have come through the EU in terms of the collaboration have, rather than inhibiting, inhibiting progress, um, led to great advances in science uh, and in the opportunities that are therefore available to the economy and to the wider um, public of the community. Those seem to me very strong arguments and on that basis it seems to me uh, unanswerable that this case continues to be made. Thank you very much. And I call on Ian Gray to wind up for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> President Officer. Um, as expected, uh, we've heard this afternoon uh, lots of examples of how successful Scotland is in science uh, research and the excellence of our universities. Indeed, uh, Dr Claire Baker uh, demonstrated how she epitomises that excellence in her own stellar uh, qualifications. Um, but she also pointed out uh, an important uh, European project which is sometimes missed in these debates, and that's Erasmus+, Plus, and others have mentioned too how important that is. Uh, Ross Greer, in talking about that, uh, made it clear that colleges participate in uh, European-wide collaborations as well as universities. Uh, and Gil Patterson, I think, made an important point about uh, the Golden Jubilee Hospital and how those kind of uh, institutions are also engaged in international collaborative cutting-edge uh, research. So, uh, the debate that we have this afternoon is not, presiding officer, uh, just about uh, our universities. It's much uh, wider than that. Uh, we did have, at one stage, uh, I thought quite uh, an entertaining diversion into a debate on obsession, uh, where Mr. Mundell posited uh, Mr. Scott's obsession with uh, a people's vote, and he responded with the obsession of uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and some of Mr. Mundell's uh, other uh, colleagues, their obsession uh, with uh, Brexit. Uh, I talked a little about social scientists as well as scientists. One of our great social scientists, of course, was uh, Adam Smith, who once said uh, this, science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Uh, and I hope that uh, that is true, that, that science can be part of the antidote to the rather poisonous enthusiasm for Bre Brexit uh, of the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg and indeed uh, Boris Johnson, or the superstition of the highly dubious claims they and some of their colleagues have made uh, about the benefits of Brexit. Maureen Watt spoke uh, uh, earlier uh, about some of, uh, some of those. And therein lies the problem, presiding officer, with the Tory uh, contribution this afternoon and their motion. Mr. Mundell uh, spoke in all sincerity, I am sure, of his desire for a smooth and orderly Brexit. And that is the thrust uh, of the Tory motion. Uh, the trouble is, Mr. Mundell, that there appears to be no such thing. Uh, uh, Mr. Stewart talked about his confidence that uh, uh, there would be every possible continuation of participation and collaboration uh, in research. But Mr. Stewart, no one has any confidence in that continued participation. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank uh, Mr Gray for uh, giving way. Does he not recognise that if uh, the UK Labour Party and the House of Commons seriously got behind Theresa May's approach to, to build a consensus, uh, then we'd be in a stronger position to deliver certainty? Uh, well, no, I absolutely don't, because uh, Theresa May's approach to Brexit has been a catastrophe. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'll say more about that later. Rachel Hamilton uh, uh, complained to the government benches about the negativity of their uh, motion, which, which we will support. And I have to say to Ms Hamilton, I bow to nobody in my scepticism of the Scottish government, but even I can't stretch it to say that the problem with Brexit is their negativity uh, about, about the Brexit deal. I mean, really, the, the problem, Mr Stewart, is the lack of confidence in our scientific community in what is happening. Gillian Martin pointed out they don't know what kind of Brexit they're looking at. Mr. Scott pointed out that only 3% of the scientific community feel they've been listened to in any way at all. 
and uh, Joan McAlpine and David Stewart gave us exact illustrations of damage which has already happened through the experience of the UHI and a fall uh, in funding. So the problem, Mr Mundell, is that nobody believes this Tory cover government can or is delivering a smooth and orderly Brexit. And that really is our difficulty with the Liberal Democrat Amendment 2. I personally find the idea of a people's vote very attractive, and many colleagues do, as Mr Scott has said. But I have to say, even more attractive do I find the idea of a general election and the prospect and opportunity to get rid of that shambolic <laughs> Conservative government entirely responsible for the whole sorry mess of Brexit and their utterly incompetent two years of so-called negotiation, which is and will do damage to our science and research base here in Scotland and so much else behind. That general election remains Labour Party's preference to find our way out of this mess created by that Conservative government. Thank you very much. Colin Miles Briggs to conclude for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close today's debate uh, for the Scottish Conservatives. And let me first, um, on a positive note, like Oliver Mundell, join colleagues from across all parties in this chamber who've commended the excellent work of Scotland's scientists and researchers and the massive contribution science, innovation and research makes to our Scottish economy. This is especially so in my Lothian region, with its vibrant life sciences sector, which underpins many jobs locally. Earlier this year, I visited Edinburgh's genomics at the Roslyn Institute and was able to see their clinical facility and the gene sequencing labs which they have there. The work being undertaken by Professor Bruce Whitelaw and his team is truly inspiring and has massive potential in the future, which means Scotland is today well placed to play a leading role in both exploiting and showing the world the potential for gen genetic technologies to make significant impacts on health provision. All of us, I believe, need to get behind championing the work of these pioneering scientists, and today we've heard that from some members. Rachel Hamilton, Jamie Green and Alexandra Stewart specifically took the opportunity in this debate to do that in their own areas. Any new political deal with the EU, and I have confidence that we'll see a comprehensive deal emerge in the next few weeks, may provide the short-term challenges around this funding system which we've outlined today. But the UK government is committed to work with industry and academia to resolve these issues and support these sectors. Indeed, as Oliver Mundell outlined, the UK government early in the withdrawal process guaranteed funding for UK research projects otherwise supported by the EU until 2020. And the UK government is continuing to look at how we can support research posts after 2020. A number of members have spoken about Horizon 2020 specifically, and I think it's an important point and something on these benches we've been working around. And I just wondered, in terms of the SNP, what their white paper had looked at when they were putting forward the case for Scotland to leave the UK and leave the EU. And specifically, it says this point. There's a lovely picture of Dolly the sheep, but not much detail. But it says this, and I think it's important for this debate. Our universities are already active players on the world stage, extending their world-class teaching, offering and forming partnerships and research collaborations across the globe. We're keen to further develop these collaborations as a sovereign nation state to promote Scottish higher education overseas. I don't see anything in that which the UK government is not doing to do the exact same today. So instead of spreading the doom and gloom which we've heard today, the SNP and the Scottish Government should be making a similar commitment to back these important sectors. Look at what they can do to help to send out the message globally that Scotland and our United Kingdom are open for business and want to see more research development and innovation take place here. The fundamentals of our research and science sectors remain strong, not least as we have a high concentration of world-class universities like Edinburgh, Napier and Harriet Watt here in Edinburgh providing high, highly skilled graduates, if Scots can actually get into their universities, as I've outlined from a number of members with regards to our medical uh, degrees. Scotland's life science sector, though, is a key part of our international reputation 
for scientific excellence and our pharmaceutical industry. And it's an important element uh, which I want to speak about. I very much welcome the recently published Fraser of Allender, Allender Institute report into the economic contribution of the pharmaceutical industry here in Scotland. This showed that the industry supports a total of £2.5 billion pounds worth of industrial output in Scotland and that ex exports of manufactured pharmaceutical products contributed £462 million pounds to the Scottish economy and helped to underpin 5,000 jobs across our country. And every 100 jobs in the wider pharmaceutical sector supports an additional 240 jobs elsewhere in the Scottish economy. And concerns are already being expressed, about, however, about the falling levels of business spending on research and development in Scotland. SNP ministers have already fudged previous targets they made themselves to set a, grow, a growth in the life science sector. So clearly more to be done to encourage more investment. And we have ideas in action how to actually achieve that. One thing SNP ministers could do and should do is to take forward action to ensure that data capturing cap capabilities do not slip back further than they already have here. This means linking primary and secondary care data so clinical trials can take place here in Scotland in the exact same similar basis as trials are taking place today, such as JSK's Salford Lung Study in England. This is a major issue for pharma companies across Scotland and one I hope the Minister, and I welcome him to his position today, uh, will actually take seriously and look at to make sure Scotland doesn't fall behind the rest of the United Kingdom in some of these areas. Scotland's research and scientific base are a real success story, and I hope today was about celebrating that. Scottish Conservatives value hugely the contribution of our scientists and our researchers. And while we accept that Brexit may in future change some of the funding streams, we're confident the UK government and the Scottish government, if it steps up to the plate, can work positively with industry and academia to put in place the new schemes that will grow the value of these sectors and further boost our international reputation in the future. We on these benches believe that the best days of Scotland's researchers and scientists actually lie ahead of them and Scotland. And for Tavish Scott's points, you know, as someone with a Shetland fishing interest, he maybe just forgot to mention the fact that this last week we learnt of the support and the boost to Scotland's fishing industry when the UK government announced a pledge of extra £12 million to develop and support cutting-edge fishing technologies and safety measures with £10 million to establish an innovation fund UK research and innovation will establish uh, that fund to ensure the UK is a world leader in safe, sustainable and productive fishing. Scotland can and must be a world leader in fisheries research and we on these benches are committed to doing just that. To conclude, presiding officer, at some point, and this debate's really demonstrated that this point, SNP ministers are going to actually have to get behind Scotland and the United Kingdom in what is the most difficult political negotiation in a generation. The more the SNP talk down Scotland's science and innovation research sectors, the greater impact it can have on international companies looking today to invest in our country. Great countries come together to turn challenges into opportunities, and we should all be working on these benches to realise the potential of Scotland's research and scientific sectors to our Scottish economy. I support the amendment in my colleague Oliver Mundell's name. Thank you. And I call on Richard Lockhead to conclude the debate for the Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much uh, welcome this debate and all the contributions from across the Chamber, uh, many of which, of course, I may well uh, comment on. And it does remind me that we do want to pay tribute to our research community and our higher education institutions and other institutions in Scotland that make such an uh, immense contribution to our economy uh, and to de developing uh, knowledge and curiosity. And of course, I was actually just thinking how there's one company in Forest in my constituency. Uh, there's two people that work for a consultancy, consultancy called Aurora Consultancy. And they're developing sustainable materials for fish boxes, which is, of course, a big issue in the world's oceans at the moment. And one of the two people is Scottish, and the other person that runs the company is Italian. So we have to remember this is an issue in terms of the impact of Brexit on our research in this country. It's not just about higher education institutions and our research institutions. It's right across Scotland and right across Scotland's economy uh, as well. There's been a lot of consensus in the debate around that contribution, and I very much welcome it. There's even been quite a lot of consensus around the Chamber about protecting that contribution uh, in terms of Brexit. That is a very important consensus that we have to all rally around in the very challenging months and potential years ahead. Uh, I 
do think it's really important that we maintain, firstly, the mobility of our researchers and staff to move around Europe and to Scotland and back and forth to Europe, and likewise to maintain our participation, our full participation in the EU funding programmes moving forward uh, as well. In terms of the amendments, the SNP uh, will today and the Scottish Government be supporting Tavis Scott and the Liberal Lib Democrat amendments in terms of the people's vote. It is, of course, a democratic outrage. It is a democratic outrage that Scotland faces being dragged out of the EU against their will, particularly what we were told by the No campaign and the independence referendum in 2014. So people in Scotland voted to remain and another EU referendum would indeed be an opportunity to ensure the wishes of the people of this country are respected and that's why we will support the amendment today. Of course, it's only about an opportunity, not a guarantee and it wouldn't necessarily protect Scotland from the same outcome as in 2016. And likewise, we will support the Labour Party amendment today, and that raises the issue of maintaining our participation in Horizon 2020 going forward, where Scotland has punched above our weight. We've secured 558 million euros uh, over the current programme, and it's really important we have full participation in Horizon Europe, the success of that programme moving forward. But in terms of the complacency from the Conservative Party, in terms of EU funding, if the withdrawal agreement is signed, the UK will continue to participate fully in EU programmes. So yes, Scottish organisations are eligible to participate in all aspects of Horizon 2020, we're told, but until Brexit. And the real big question is what happens thereafter. And even in terms of the, the deal that will be signed, there's still a, lot of, there's a lack of clarity around even our participation up to the end of Horizon 2020 uh, as well. These are very valuable funds in Scotland, the same jobs. Uh, and their ability to take part in collaborative research projects across the whole of Europe. The Scottish Government is going to continue to do a lot of work to highlight the impact of Brexit uh, on this sector in Scottish research, science and innovation. Uh, there's a Brexit forum we have with the higher education and research sector. Uh, also, I will be taking a delegation to London to meet the UK Government to highlight the importance of protecting it. And likewise, I'll be taking a delegation, hopefully soon, from across the sector to Brussels to make a case to Brussels as well to continue the participation uh, in many of those programmes. I think it's a bit rich for Rachel Hamilton who said that the only reason why the SNP is discussing this today is because of our grievance agenda. Well, it's a bit rich for the party that's taking Scotland out of Europe against their will to talk to us about a grievance agenda. <laughs> it's also a brass net for the Conservative Party to put forward uh, the hard Brexiteer Oliver Mundell to champion and lead for the Conservative Party in a debate about one of the sectors that's going to take one of the biggest hits from Brexit, which he voted for and which he supports. Yep. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, but I think it's pretty rich to come to this chamber and call me a hard Brexiteer. Uh, when his colleagues at Westminster refuse to say whether or not they will back a deal uh, that will prevent a hard Brexit. Yeah. It's the SNP who are determined, uh, to, determined to undermine the United Kingdom. They're determined uh, to set us back. And now they tell us today they want to delay Brexit by another year to have a rerun of an argument and a debate that's already been had and where they don't accept the result. Richard Lockett. For Oliver Mundell to accuse the SNP and the Scottish Government today of being negative by highlighting this issue in the Scottish Parliament, where it is going to have a negative impact. There's not one student, there's not one researcher, there's not one lecturer, there's not one member of the business community who thinks we're going to be anything than worse off with Brexit. Therefore, it's going to have a negative impact and the Scottish Conservative Party should be telling the UK Government about that negative impact and stop it happening in the first place. We do need a lot of clarity over the settled status of EU nationals in Scotland today. This is a big issue in campuses around Scotland. Michael Russell, the Brexit Minister today, was telling us how he visited the University of Stirling and he was speaking to the students there this morning about the anxiety, or well, about a report they've carried out into the impact of Brexit on the EU nationals who study at the University of Stirling uh, at the moment. The international students there feel anxious over the uncertainty generated by Brexit. They feel there's been a lack of information available to them, which is a barrier to their plans to stay in Scotland and the UK. They've highlighted the value of learning in a multicultural environment and expressed worry that Brexit might threaten this. So this is what's really happening out there that the Scottish Conservative Party are really, really complacent about. And, you know, we have to give certainty to our EU students, to our researchers and our staff from Europe, working, contributing to Scotland as soon as possible. And the Conservative Party and the UK government are not doing that at all. 
and indeed for the Conservative Party they say everything will be fine, everything will be all right, when in October the UK Prime Minister said that her proposals will end freedom of movement once and for all in the UK. Now, the development of new scientific approaches in Scotland has always depended on free exchange of ideas between the researchers, regardless of their geography or political boundaries. And that international collaboration is extremely important for Scotland, and it delivers for our economy. I met Dame Anne Glover from the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh, the President, just a couple of days ago, and she handed me this document, which I then went and read which I recommend to members. It's called Science Scotland. It's published by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It's the issue 22 summer 2018 edition. And what it does is it highlights nine of the most promising young companies in Scotland. And this is about nine entrepreneurs who've emerged from Scotland's higher education sector in the main and who are now starting up these companies which we've got high hopes for to deliver jobs and innovation and research breakthroughs for the people of Scotland in the future. And I was reading through about the entrepreneurs and out of the nine, out of the nine, three are people who've moved from EU countries to live and work in Scotland and contribute to our country. These are people who are going to face barriers in the future, and that's why the Brexit proposals from the UK government are going to cause so much damage to our country. So we need mobility, and we need to be able to continue in these research programmes moving forward. I want to just finish by reiterating some of my opening remarks from today about just why this issue is so important to Scotland. I remind you, we employ proportionally more EU academic staff at our universities and institutions compared to the rest of the UK. We have proportionally more EU students compared to the rest of the UK. We have proportionally more outgoing domestic students participating in Erasmus Plus compared to the rest of the UK. We punch way above our weight in securing EU research funding compared to the rest of the UK. We have a higher rate of full-time research staff working in our universities from the EU compared to the rest of the UK. And that's why this issue is so, so important. And to finish, Ian Gray said that uh, he was uh, quoting Einstein and stupidity when he was speaking uh, in the past. And that reminded me that at this time of year, that in 1910, a general was asked, will there be a world war in Europe? And he said it was inconceivable stupidity on the part of statesmen if such a scenario was to arise. And of course, we know what happened in 1914, and we'll be remembering that this Sunday. But, un but we have the situation now, we have the stupidity of politicians in the Conservative Party and in the UK government, who have taken us to the brink of leaving the European Union, inflicting massive damage on our international reputation, on Scottish jobs, on research, on funding, and potentially the quality of life of the people of Scotland. We have to stop that happening, and that's why I ask Parliament to back the motion today. Thank you very much. That concludes this afternoon's debate. Our next item of business is consideration of Business Motion 14657 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Motion 14657 be, agree, be agreed. Is everybody agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 14658 and 14659 on stage one timetables for two bills. Uh, does any member uh, wish to speak against either motion? Could I call on Graham Day to move the motions on behalf of the Bureau? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one indicates they wish to speak against the motions. The question, therefore, is that motions 14658 and 14659 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 14660 on designation of a lead committee and 14661 and 14662 on approval of SSIs? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. We'll turn now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 14638.1 in the name of Oliver Mundell, which seeks to amend motion 14638 in the name of Richard Lockhead on safeguarding Scotland's international research collaborations and reputation for scientific excellence from the threat of Brexit be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 14638.1 in the name of Oliver Mundell is yes, 28, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14638.3 in the name of Ian Gray, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Richard Lockhead, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14638.2 in the name of Tavish Scott, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Richard Lockhead, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 14638.2 in the name of Tavish Scott is yes, 65, no, 30. There were 20 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Motion 14638 in the name of Richard Lockhead, as amended, on safeguarding Scotland's international research collaborations and reputation for scientific excellence from the threat of Brexit, be agreed. Are we all agreed? <laughs> We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 14638 in the name of Richard Lockhead as amended is yes, 66, no, 28. There were 21 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No, that's good. The question is that motions 14660, 14661 and 14662 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Liam Kerr on emergency service workers. And we'll just take a few moments for ministers and the members to change seats. <laughs>